Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Car Chat Podcast. And with me today, I have Matt Pryor. Hello. Hello. How are you? Great. Great. Thanks. Good. Can you tell the audience a little bit about, sort of tiny summary, sort of who you are and what you do? Yeah, my name's Matt Pryor. I'm, uh, the short of it is I'm a consumer journalist. I work at uh, Autocar Magazine where I'm uh, editor at large, because Every, everybody's got to have editor in their job title somewhere <laughs> on a magazine. It's just, it's compulsory. After you've been there a while, it's it's compulsory. <laughs> Uh, which means I write and talk about cars. Um, I'm t- I tend to be our sort of lead feature writer and, and presenter. Um, Auto cars, great weekly magazines, been going 126 years this year. 126 there, years. I know it's amazing, isn't it? It is amazing. I'm, I've been there 16 of them. Um, yeah, 18. So it established 1895, and it, back in the day when you still had to have a, somebody in a, with a red flag walk in front of the. That's when it came Walk out. Walk in front of the car. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah. So it was uh, established in the, in the interests of the mechanically propelled carriage, I think it, I think is the accurate description. And it's been done every, every week, every week since then, I think with the exception of a couple of weeks in the 1970s when there were strikes and paper shortages and stuff like that. But um, yeah, it's, is, it's amazing. It's relentless, but it's great. exceptionally impressive. Yeah. Just yeah. to like, you know, just keep it going one a week. Like. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I think with the, I think it started, if I'm right, with the, with the kind of um, deadlines that we've become used to. Somebody decided, right, we're going to do it and then published it like two or three days later. And yeah. that was, that was it. It's just, yeah, it was just into it and it, it doesn't stop. So if you like, uh, if you like cars, you like talking about cars, you like writing about cars and you like reporting on the industry, there is, it, there's, there, I don't think there's anywhere else quite like it. It's, it's mega. It's it's not a magazine that I've read much. Mm. Um, I, I don't read that many magazines anymore anyway, um, and I was sort of drawn towards other ones. But I I did read it. Re- I started reading some of it today of of this week's. Okay. Maybe last week's. And there's a couple of topics. And straight away, like a couple of pages in, I was like, oh, I think I'm going to have to... What stupid as it sounds? I was like, I'm going to have to read some more you of this. you to read it. Oh, good. Because oh, good. there's... It was, and it was a whole bunch of sort of industry related, slightly sideline, yeah. lots of things that gave me a lot of stuff to think about mm. rather than, and yes, you have the car, you know, this car this week and that sort of stuff. But I hadn't really, specifically with what I'm doing is, yeah. it's very much like, oh, this is some, I've got some great inspiration. Oh, for totally. To talk yeah. About. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, I write a column in it and I will quite often just read the mag from the week before. If I'm, you know, <laughs> if I'm, if I'm struggling with something, I'll just look at some news pages and go, right, what are we going to, what, what is going? And it's, yeah, I think because it's weekly and like you say, we have the, the big car group tests and everything else, but because it's, because it's weekly, it has scope to, to cover much more industry stuff. Plus also somebody will go, oh, you know what, this is, this is interesting. Uh, how many, I don't, I don't know, the, the sort of, a guy called John Evans writes for us a lot, a lot of consumer stuff and he just will do a sort of two page on something you've, that you've kind of thought about, but never actually found an answer to. And every yeah. week he'll just bang out something like that. It's, I really, yeah, I, I like it as a publication. And um, I think we moved to um, what, what used to be perfect bound, which means it had a sort of a non-stapled spine and now it has a stapled spine. I think a lot of people at some point, like you say, didn't read it all the time or looked at it and thought, well, it's, a, it's thin for a monthly. Yeah. And then at some point we moved to a stapled spine, which um, gives it a more vibrant weekly feel, I think. And people at that point went, oh yeah, oh yeah, it's a weekly magazine. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. I've, I've, it was like you, I didn't always read it when I was growing up. I read, uh, you know, the, the bigger, glossier monthlies and stuff like that. But there came a point when I was at university studying automotive engineering and I started reading it then and it just became the thing I read from that point on. Yeah. Okay, right. Let's let's go back a little bit or sort of back to probably around then. Mm. How did you get into all this and how did you end up as editor at large? I editor looked up that, that today and I was trying to find out. I was like... <laughs> What does he do? What's his specific title? And I found at editor large at large. Is a, like, yeah, at large is a weird one. It means you don't. It means you don't have a job specifically. <laughs> you know, if you're news, if you're news editor, if you're road test editor, if you know you have you have a specific job, and that's you know you have a section you yeah. a section of the mag you're responsible for. But at large just means you do a bit of uh, a bit of everything. So I kind of wanted to be a car designer. I think I was always into engineering mm. and. Um, uh, I, I was also into, into cars, and uh, my dad worked for the for the Ministry of Defence in a in a place called CME, which is a School of Electrical and Mechanical Engineers. They used to fix tanks and Land Rovers okay. and stores and train soldiers how to do those things out in the field. So uh, when we could, you know, they would have open days in the summer and take your take your kids to to work day, you know, and 
but in taking your kids to work means I'll show you around a, a, a shed full of tanks. I mean, that's quite, that's quite, that's quite cool. That's really cool. So um, I was always into, you know, machines and, and stuff like that. And I sort of fancy being a car designer, hadn't really done the right GCSEs and A-levels to do design. So I thought, well, I'll look at engineering and uh, university prospectuses when they show engineering, car engineering courses, they've always got somebody, you know, doing a clay model because it looks much better than somebody sitting and doing yeah. a page of physics. But anyway, so I rocked up in my first week and it was maths and physics nonstop, <laughs> thermodynamics, electronics and control systems. And I just thought, blimey, can I, can I do this anyway? I stuck, stuck with it and did do it. And I was coming up to, to graduate and I had a, a, a sort of job offer from a plastics company that I'd done an industrial placement with to go back to. Um, and I saw a little thing on the notice board saying, I'm a local journalist. I studied this course 25 years ago, and now I want a picture researcher for six weeks to work over the summer on a publication called the Express World Car Guide, which I hadn't heard of um, at the time. But I thought, well, six weeks, you know, that'll do me. But well, I sort something out, so I find a, find a place to live and then think about, you know, a, you know, writing to this plastics company and then going and designing and making windscreen wiper grommets for the next... 30, 40 years. And yeah. uh, anyway, so I went for it and, and I got this gig for six weeks over the summer and then two or three weeks into it, uh, Peter Burgess, the, the journalist who it was, said, uh, I've been thinking about taking somebody on full time. Would you like a job? And I said, yeah, that'd be great. Thanks very much. Stayed with him for three years and then moved to a company called Four Car, which was Channel 4's motoring website, edited by Richard Bremner, who's a uh, really well-known established uh, journalist of formerly of car magazine and an autocar and motor and stuff. Stayed there for five years. He moved to autocar and then about a year later phoned me up and said, look, we've got a vacancy on the road test desk. Do you fancy it? So that was 16 years ago. And um, I was I joined as deputy road test editor, which is a real job. Then road test editor, which is another real job. <laughs> and then uh, they've given me this other job title, which I, you know, I just, I just write a lot of, I just write a lot of stuff basically. And, That's the and were you, were you road testing from the beginning? Or yeah, pretty much. I mean, the, my first job was, uh, I did all sorts really. I mean, I was doing a little bit of road testing, but I was also doing things like auto expresses, used car prices, diesel cars, used car price guide. Used to do a bit of stuff for sort of glasses guide and sort of ghost write columns for people and, and as well as a couple of our own publications and things. So I was doing a bit, a bit of everything, a lot of short, short story mm. writing and not always road testing, but I, I started sort of reviewing cars reasonably quickly for this, for this, for this express car guide plus yeah. also uh, another one. But it was, yeah, it took me until it was a, it was a, you know, I walked the boards for a little while before I started testing cars properly. And it's funny, you know, when, when people come in on, when people want to, well, when we had an office, we'd come in on people, we come in on work experience and you can tell people who, are going to stick around for a while because they just say, what, what don't you want to do today? And there's other people come in and go, right, brilliant. What great cars can I drive? I think, well, <laughs> not sure it doesn't, I mean, you know, eventually, yeah, you'll drive some stuff, but there's an awful lot of not driving stuff uh, as well. And imagine uh, an awful lot of driving cars that you're, oh, actually, this is a, this is a I feel like it's a relevant question, mm. that most people might go, that's boring. That seems like a boring car. Why would you want to drive it? But because it's auto car or whatever, it needs to be driven needs to yep. be examined and do you get a sort of level of enjoyment out of those processes in maybe a different manner yeah. to that yeah, i would look I, at it i do i mean one i like driving city cars and if somebody this is always the, the answer people don't want if somebody says what's the best car in the world <laughs> they're expecting bugatti chiron or ferrari f40 or yeah. whatever whereas actually the the best car in the world arguably i i make this point that people switch off this point they've got no interest they don't want to know when i go well it's probably something like a ford fiesta ztec s <laughs> because you know to to put all that engineering into a car um it costs more to engineer than it does to engineer a supercar um it's up against much closer competitors uh so price is, is absolutely crucial and emissions are absolutely crucial and it has to you'd have to get all of that right and then make it enjoyable and desirable and do all of that for 14 grand you know that's that's remarkable and that's the remarkable bit of the of the industry and i also think that doing writing a city car group test is really hard writing supercar group tests is easy because they're different <laughs> And they're exciting. So, so yeah. you know, people just, what, what are they like to drive? Simple as 2,000 words on a city car group test. You know, they're all within five millimetres of length. They're all within three quid on a monthly purchase deal. They're the, you know, they are, they are, it's the toughest section of the market 
manufacturers save every single penny out of it because you can't afford to give anything away. And it's, yeah, and it's, it's hard and they are similar. You know, they've all got five seats, seat, the rear seats fold. They're all 3.8 metres long. It's, it's, it's difficult, <laughs> but I like it because I like those, I like those cars. You know, I yeah. like, uh, I like the engineering throughout. And also you can drive a city car and have quite a lot of fun in it and be going at 25 miles an hour. So, uh, you know, whereas if you try the same in some supercars, you'd be going about 4 million miles an hour. So they're, uh, I th- yeah, I think they're fun and they do different, the, you know, different sections of the market, but they all, in, they all interest me in, in some way. Yeah. Your, your point about the engineering budgets and the sort of design budgets for these smaller everyday cars is, it's it's interesting when you see really high end in inverted. I, okay, I'm just going to say rather than high end, expensive, like mm-hmm. really expensive stuff made in small numbers. The level of budget into a button is nowhere yeah. near. Like oh, totally, yeah. Like, now, okay, the cost that they can put into it, so your materials might be better or whatever. But it's so often you get into not not so much now, but you might get into a car and like just things are not worked out to the level mm. that you think they might be. Whereas I, I've, I've definitely said this before on the podcast, but I remember sitting down, I was at Geneva mode show. I'd snuck into the VW area above where there was serving some uh, currywurst. And this guy came and chat, chat, sat down and started talking to me. I was like, I'm not here to talk to anyone. I'm not here for any meetings. <laughs> yeah, I've just snuck in to hang out and leave my laptop here. <laughs> and um, he, anyway, I started talking to him and he was in charge of seats. Oh, okay. Pre- premium seats mm. in uh, VW and, and that sort of thing, products. And I think like quite an important person in that category. But I just it just struck me as like, what the hell? There's someone in charge yeah. of the division that is seats. Like- yeah, which, which means how big is the division in seats? Yeah. And also, you know, and also some manufacturers will have that and still buy in seats from Recaro or somebody else. So there's, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's immense. And you're right, I've, you know, like you say, not so much now, but you sometimes I've got into uh, low volume cars and you think this does, this, this is, this is a hundred grand car, but it feels hand finished in a, in a way yeah. that is not necessarily good. You know, in some ways that sort of handcrafting is great, but you know, you'd get into, and I think this is where, this is where Porsche is, um, that has been for a while has been, um, you know, pretty, pretty unique in that it manages. Yeah. It, it feels special. It feels sort of hand finished, but also the tolerances are absolutely yeah. spot on as they, as they are in a, in a mass manufactured, uh, in a mass manufactured thing. And I think it's, it's much better. I mean, you get in a modern Rolls Royce or Bentley and you know, the, the tolerances are, are fantastic and the finish is fantastic, but it still feels very special, but I don't think it's always been, I don't think that's always been the case with high end. And there are still some high end stuff where it isn't still again. Have you got any funny road testing stories from back in the day before everything went well, on social media and whatever? Not so, not so, not so much as, not so much as there used to be. I mean, I don't, you know, we've never done anything like, um, oh, crikey, the, st- the story where two people are at Millbrook and they set the cruise control oh. on the bowl <laughs> and then climb into the, climb into the back. <laughs> So nothing, nothing. I mean, we fought. We've. I say, fortunately, we we kind of missed most of that. Most of that boat. Social was. I started it at Autocar in two thousand and five, and social was starting to be a thing. But it is. It is funny how it how it plays on what you are prepared to do. Um, you know, on the on the on the on the road, particularly yeah. in terms of photos and video and stuff like that. You know, everybody's a publisher. Everybody's got access to a camera. Uh, you know, as I say to to a lot of our road testers and stuff, you may you, you know you may as well act as if somebody is filming what you're doing because there's a very strong chance they they are. And you, yeah, and I think the days when when people drove more quickly than they should and did things on the road that they that they shouldn't in the name of testing because they just thought they're you know in a quiet spot. It just I just don't think it happens anymore. And I think ultimately that's probably quite a good thing. You know, we just we'll, if we if you want to mess around in a car, you go to a you go to a test track, you know, and yeah. even then there's rules about what you can do and what you can't do. And some places are more uh, liberal than, than others. But I think, um, yeah, it is, it's, it's funny, isn't it? Not everybody likes cars. That's the truth of it. We like them. A lot of people like them. We spend a yeah. lot of our time around people who like them, but it's, if you spend any time out on the road, you, you, you know, in, in nice cars, you, you very quickly discover that not everybody likes them. Not everybody likes the noise. Uh, not everybody likes, you know, cars going even legally quickly sometimes, you know. Uh, yeah. So it's, um, 
yeah, and and to an extent, you know, we've all got to have some kind of um, as car owners and and enthusiasts, we've got, we've got some kind of responsibility to to make sure that the, the the car stays a respectable thing, you know, so that not everybody's looking at it going, God, all these cars <laughs> always going a million miles an hour, making noise, noise and stuff like that. You know, we've all got a responsibility with the fact that we like this hobby and it's, uh, we've got to keep it, we've got to keep it going somehow because car, you know, the thing is you can enjoy, you can enjoy a horse, right? And you can go to a pony club thing and nobody, nobody minds because they don't actually make any noise and disturb the yeah. outside world. And when they're going to and from, they're just trundling around slowly. So I mean, that's, you know, can be annoying, but it's not as annoying as a dozen bright yellow Lamborghinis going too fast to a racetrack and then making all this incredible noise all day. And it's, um, you know, somehow uh, it's got to be squared that this this hobby continues. Um, yeah. And, and there's a, know, with cars, there's definitely a sort of perception of safety element that if you're not in the car and you have no idea about how in control, out yeah. of control or whatever that person is. And I think mm. people in cars need to, and I need to, I, I remind myself this every now and then, that like people around you don't know yeah. whether like anything about the situation other than what they can see. And if you're the person that's doing like burnouts or whatever, or going yeah, 70 totally. miles down the street, yeah. like you're an idiot. Yeah. And people yeah. that understand are going to get pissed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's difficult. I, I mean, I see a, I don't know how it's, I don't know exactly how it's going to go, but as, um, as more cars become electrically powered, I do wonder if, uh, and it is, it is hard You speak to engineers about how they get some of the character back into a, a car when it's, when it's powered by electric motor, given that most electric motors kind of perform in the same way and they're not very, and they're not very loud. So where do you, yeah. know, if you are Ferrari, crikey, what do you, what do you do? You know, how do you do that? And I do wonder if, uh, you know, the, the market will diverge more than it, more than it has. So you have cars more like pr product design and white goods and also the hobbyist enthusiast cars that still burn stuff and become, you know, there are more resto mods, there are more old cars. And, um, yeah, that, bec that becomes a, hobby and it's and I want to be able to win well I mean I'll report on both and I quite like these from an engineering standpoint but also if I can sort of retain that hobby in a in a way that is acceptable to people yeah and then maybe some of the heat goes off goes off the car because as soon as you hear about um uh, it's you know any reports into environment the environment or safety or something else you know road cars is the you know, it bears the bears they the get hammered, don't it. they? Yeah, they do. Yeah, they right. do. And the, and the industry is not perfect by any by any means. You know, Volkswagen's diesel thing shows shows that. But by and large, I think the car has changed the world for the for the better. Which is why I you know, which is why I like them in the in the first place. I think it it doesn't matter where you are in the world, the car has improved to some extent your life because it has enabled people to travel more easily and do all the fantastic things that, you know, we've been able to do when we, when we see each other and, you know, and work together and create everything from medicines, you know, through to buildings, through to new technologies and, you know, people, it's, it's democratized people getting around quickly. And, um, you know, that's, that's, that's a, that's a great thing. So we've just got to, you know, the industry's just got to find a way that it, it can do that more, uh, yeah. more, more soundly <laughs> yeah with your uh, literally more sound um <laughs> so with with your experience of electric cars now i'm 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 in so like i go different ways on electric cars all the time and i'm i'm all for doing everything we can to save the planet like mm. i think this is a very good thing but also you need to see all the sides of everything and whether whatever avenue that is, I'm not going to suddenly turn around and go, it's got to be electric cars. If there's other options that are better, we should do all of the things. But in your experience of driving electric cars so far, um, I saw now this, this will come out in a couple of weeks time. So it will be a bit more delayed, but you, I've seen you drove the rear wheel drive Taycan recently, the mm -hmm. base model. How, yeah. how do you find electric cars in terms of fun? Uh, not as much fun as internally combusted cars generally. I think, I think probably still the most fun electric car, apart from a Nissan Leaf with plastic back tyres, which was fun for <laughs> hilarious reasons. I think the most fun I've had in, an, in a battery electric vehicle is probably 
the original Tesla Roadster, which is what, 2000, 2008, 2009? Because it was still, it was still like, you know, it felt like a very heavy Lotus Elise because that's, you know, effectively mm. what it, you know, what it, what it was. And it also had at that point, I think 100 and, I think we had a 150 mile range outfit, something like that. So you could take it to somewhere and do something useful. And, but weight is the, you know, weight is the problem. The, the, the Taycan rear drive is, is cool, really good. And because the front wheels don't do any powering, the steering's better for my, for my, for my money than, uh, than the all wheel drive Taycan. But it's still a 2.1 ton car. It's weighs it's something like, uh, yeah, it's weighs something like 300 kilos, three to 400 kilos more than a Panamera of the same size. And that's not a light car. So until battery weight comes down, uh, I think internally combusted cars will be more fun because I like lightweight cars. So the lighter you make a car, the more fun I think it, I think it is. Um, you know, so I think, and I think it will happen because there are companies who's, USPs are delivering cars that are good fun. And yeah. at some point they're going to have to involve some kind of electrification. So it'll get there. But there is, you know, to the same extent, there is enjoyment to be had from a completely smooth drivetrain. Um, mm. And also manufacturers are starting to realise, you know, what they can do with uh, torque vectoring and putting power exactly when and where they want to. You can make the ESP systems much better because you can turn on and off power much yeah. more quickly. So... So there's potential there, and I think a bit like this. This is where we get, you know, get a bit techy. But the, when manufacturers move from hydraulic power assistance to electric power steering, the first few EPS systems weren't great. But actually, now that they've done it a lot and they've got quite good at it, I think probably the best electron, electric power assistance steer, steering systems are as good as you know the the real better hydraulic ones. I mean, there are still some. Do you which think are, so? Which is fantastic. Largely, I think McLaren still, because they are hydraulic, I think they probably still have an edge over most other things. But a lot of the engineers I talk to now, they go, look, this stuff we, we can do with electric systems that we couldn't do with a hydraulic system. Yeah. And they're, get, they're certainly getting there or thereabouts, I think, you know, with probably GT, GT3 Porsches have probably been the, you know, the, the, as, good as, they've, as good as they've got. And I think they're largely as good as everything. Yeah, it's... it's- that one, they're definitely getting better and better and better and better. And but it's it's difficult because you can't I you can't compare like for like. So mm. you can let's say you drive a nine nine seven RS and you drive a nine nine one RS. It's a completely different platform. And then yeah, you've exactly. also got yeah. the electric steering. It's, it's so, hard. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, you can't compare the two straight straight back to back, which is a which is a pity. Um, but also the other, you know, part of the fun for me is. Uh, is when, if I'm driving, I quite like I quite like driving. You know, I like riding a motorbike because that's all I'm doing. So mm. actually, the changing gear and uh, you know, and the, and the and the braking and matching revs and things like that, you know, are things I enjoy. And those are things that you don't do in an EV. And um, so that's you know, that's another thing that, that yeah. makes them slightly less it's, fun than an internally combusted car. But I know an, you know, for an everyday car to get you from A to B, mm. yeah, what, like perfect, perfect, yeah. Better yeah. than a petrol engined car. Oh, totally. Yeah, totally. Because also if you have, I know not everybody does, I think only sort of just over, it's like 55% of people can charge a car at home overnight. But the fact is if your car is plugged in and you just want it to the right temperature when you get in in the morning, I mean, yeah. that's, that's great. That's, that's a, you know, there are, there are real advantages to them. I mean, there are drawbacks too, but there are real, you know, real advantages from a user perspective to them and uh i yeah i see the appeal of that i see the appeal of that a lot a weird topic that i i picked up from autocar when i was reading it this week um currently in cities we have or in london specifically we have like a ultra low emission zone and that's going Mm. to expand and you know trying to remove particulates from the air because everyone's getting ill and dying which is actually happening um but the article forgive me i can't remember who it was by one of the points that came up, it was looking at life cycle of cars, mm. uh, a life cycle cost of electric cars versus that. And and that's a, that's a whole topic in itself. But a particular point that he brought up that I didn't know about was a significant portion. Now, when you start to get down to the 100 grams per kilometre or b- below of that is tyres. Yeah. Yeah. And... Yeah, rubber and also brake brake dust, but yeah, tires is a huge yeah tires is a huge 
issue. We did report actually recently on some company that has just uh, is, just, is developing a thing that will would catch the particulates from your tires okay. as you as you drive. But it is a yeah, it is a problem, and I wonder if it's a bigger problem now than it used to be uh, when tires were pretty hard and lasted. 40,000 miles and, and cars were a lot lighter. and everything else. Yeah. And they were a lot lighter. So now you're putting, like you say, two tons of EV, uh, on the road on, you know, reasonable performance tires because it needs decent tires to stop and go yeah. and steer properly. Uh, yeah, I, it is, there's always something, isn't there? Do you know what I mean? Every time, every time you make a move, you discover something else and you eventually, you know, you'll eventually, yeah. you'll eventually get there. That was a crazy but, one. Uh, I, that fact. And then they put a number on it. It was like 500 kilos is 20% worse in terms of the emissions yeah. from your tyres. Like even the concept that your tyres are emitting stuff just seems weird, but mm. it makes sense. They're breaking down yeah, yeah, yeah. particles yeah. going in the air or whatever. Mm. But just, it, it's all very complicated. But right, let's sidestep the electric stuff for a bit. Okay. The rise of the retro mod. Retro, uh -huh. rest, retro, retro, rest, mod, rest, 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 resto mod. Rest, well, either or, but yeah, resto mod. Modified, you know, older Modified, stuff. Modified, restored, yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about that versus modern supercars going forward? Um, cool, blimey. Uh, I like Resto. I like them very much. And, I, and there are some which are really, really good fun. But I'm also, uh, there are some supercars that I really like <laughs> very much too. So, I mean, the nice thing, I think, I think there's a place for both. If, yeah. I were, if, if I wrote out my dream car collection, I suspect I would have more old cars with decent mechanicals than I would have new supercars. My favourite new supercar is the, is probably a Ferrari F8. Uh, anything that, that I think Ferrari's mid-engine supercar has been, has been the best mid-engine supercar for the best part of a decade from 458 mm. onwards. You know, I think it's been so good. And, I, and I'm sure that the creation of the new generation of McLaren automotive has pushed Ferrari to, to do that. And although not all of my colleagues agree, if you if you put the McLaren and the Ferrari of the of the yeah. competitors together all the way through the last decade, the Ferrari has been a little bit ahead for me just because of the way it, just because of the way it corners. Uh, and I really like that. And I it's you know it's a really joyous car to drive, and really good fun car to drive. But I would feel probably less of a Burke in an Alpha Holix GTA, <laughs> and yeah. I and I would probably enjoy it more uh, more often. Because it's smaller and it's lighter uh, and I've got more to do because it's got a manual gearbox and you can stay on the throttle for longer because it doesn't, doesn't go as fast in a straight yeah. line. And yeah. Um, yeah, so I think I, I like them both, but I, but I, do, I do like a resto mod. And what I, what I like about them when they're done well, and I think this is probably the key, modern cars have a body, body stiffness, uh, a nodal stiffness, which is so great that the suspension can do exactly what it is meant to do. Yeah. Uh, and old cars, as their spot welds start to go and stuff like that, I was speaking to Gordon Murray about this re recently, and I, he didn't. He didn't arrive. He arrived at work in his uh, Alpha Holics Zagato thing, which was, which was looks okay, amazing. Yeah. And I said, "Do you still have that smart roadster?" He said, "Well, I don't because the body stiffness started to go when the spot welds let go." Um, and that's the, you know, that's the thing with old cars. So if you can get their shells stiff again, and then you can, you know, then they start to steer like they should have done in the first place or better than they should have done in the first place. Uh, and then you have all the other advantages that perhaps came with them. You know, the, the mechanical interaction of, of the engines and gearboxes and manual steering systems and brakes and things like that, you know, all that stuff that, you know, that brings it right to you. So I think there's um, a place for both, but the resto mod does excite me. And I just think over the next... 30, 40 years, we've got such a good back catalogue of, of cars that haven't fallen apart. Um, yeah. If you, you were can to, stiffen up. If, if you, okay, so I've got two questions. What's mm. your favourite of the, or maybe like top two or something of the current ones that are available? Uh, I, I'll tell you what, I haven't driven uh, any 911 by Singer and I haven't driven an Eagle um, <laughs> They're like the but two I, hear, I really want to drive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, same. I, but I hear tremendous. I hear tremendous things about that ego, I, and I, I, so I think, yeah, I'd, I'd be, I'd love to try. I'm not, a, I'm not a massive E type fan. I mean, I don't, you know, I like them, but I'm not, you know, they're, I, they're not my, yeah. they're not my favorite car or anything. But I, they do look great, and the low drag coupe looks, looks sensational. I'd love to, so I'd love to try that. The Alpha Holix is probably my favorite resto mod. It's probably within my top 10 car, the most fun cars I've ever driven, I would say. 
uh, maybe maybe top four or five. I think it's terrific. And I'd, I'd really like a sort of resto modded muscle car of some kind. I don't know what, Ooh, I'm not that yeah. fast about muscle cars, but just something that's something that's got some kind of old school, loud, uh, grumpy engine in it, but also has <laughs> some semblance of body stiffness and brakes and stuff like that would, but yeah, that would, that would excite me. And I'd be quite happy that, you know, if somebody said, there's your two car garage, sort of low riding muscle car and a an alcoholics gta i'd be well pleased yeah that would be a pretty cool i, it, I yeah. find it funny every every now and then i'll go be with someone and we'll go out in some old car or whatever and it, it, i can never get over shit brakes <laughs> oh yeah. yeah it's one of those things that like <laughs> yeah of all the things like you can never i can never ever get in any car that's got awful brakes yeah. and go no, that's that's character. Like it's not because it's no, really no, no, dangerous. Exactly. No, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I've got an old. I've got a seventy three Volkswagen Beetle, which is in yeah. sort of Baja Bug spec. Which okay, is, cool. Which is quite cool. So it rides quite high, but it's terrible. It is the worst car I've ever driven. By no, by <laughs> that's no exaggeration. It's it's appalling, and the brakes are yeah, and the brakes are one of it. The, I do want to. I do want to make it better. I thought it would be like a cut price aerial nomad or something, but it's yeah. just shocking. It's <laughs> so, um, but it's on my list of things. It, quite a long list of things to do, which is sort it out because you know people do still race and rally them and stuff like that. And the body, I think the body is quite stiff because it's got a, a cage in it. But and so the steering isn't terrible apart from the twenty-year-old remolds that are still on it. Are, but but anyway, it's on my list of things of, to, to sort out. But yes, I agree. You just want something to go and go and stop, but I still want to retain um, the, the interaction and the size, yeah, and the size and the and the and the character, you know, and because um, you've got an old nine eleven, haven't you? Yes, which, is, I've, I've which, got back which to presumably it. does that sort of thing, doesn't it? It, you know, it does it perfectly, um, and I think like with anyone, you you have something for a while and you start thinking how you might change it or whatever, or being stuck at home for ages, mm. um, and the thing that. I took it out the other day just to do some mundane stuff. I had to go to the shop or whatever. And it just fired back into my mind how great being in something kind of old, small, mm. you've got to, you know, you've got to pump the throttle pedal before you start it up to get a bit of fuel going and all that sort of stuff. All those things. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I wouldn't want to do 50,000 miles in one go in it, but mm. go down to the pub, do the odd road trip. It's just, yep. You get so much more out of the in between A and B. Yes, exactly. And what else are you doing? That's the exactly. other thing. You know, until so, until cars can drive themselves, and, and that is, you know, who know who knows how a far that time, is away. It's a long time away. Until that time, you know, that, there's only one thing you can be doing, which is driving. So you might as well make that as fun as as as, as fun as possible. And I I kind of think about it the same way as driving, a bit like cooking. You know, we all, we don't have you don't have to do it if you really don't want to. You you know you can buy stuff that somebody else has cooked, but most of us still enjoy it to some extent. So you might as well try and do it well. You might as well try and enjoy it as much as you can. Is the is the way I I think about it. You know, and you if you have to if you've got to be in a car, well, you might as well be in something you'll enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. And I the thing the thing I was going to say about my back day that it's it's quite a grippy setup at the moment, mm -hmm. um, which means when you get to the edge of grip, it's it's a it's oh, quite it snappy quite swift um but this is okay because i generally drove to the try and drive it on the road so i'm not yeah. not really pushing it like that much but i have taken to the track a couple of times and it's quite interesting but i had a passenger ride in a two liter 65 race car mm. and that's on skinnier tires and that experience of it's quite it's probably quite a bit lighter than my car maybe 200 kilos or something okay um, on skinnier, skinny tires, the way it handled the transitions from grip to no grip was just lovely. Uh, like you can I still would, go yeah. quite fast in those. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to try something like that. Have you? There, there is a there is brilliant onboard footage of one racing at Spa, isn't there? Where where every time, just as it turns into the corner, that's it's <sighs> already on the lock. And yes, it just, it's and like a Belgian a, guy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I saw a clip yesterday of of of, of a two litre, maybe one of Tut Hill's two litre cup cars or something, just being, you know, just coming down into the uh, you know into the dip before Eau Rouge and yeah. stuff, and it just be it just being totally backed, you know, just just as it steers, <laughs> just goes onto lock. And I yeah, I'd love I'd love to have a go in that. I think that would yeah that would be that could well be if you said you know what's your ideal resto mod something like that Perfect. yeah and and so th this has got me thinking it's like well if I would just like possibly want a little bit less grip because yeah I, was, I can't remember I was talking to someone recently and it was like in a two car garage like 
I could see if it's if it's me and like you can only have two cars, ignoring specifically what they are. I want one car that's like supremely comfortable, supremely capable, that can just get me from A to B without mm. me really thinking about it too much, just like transport and maybe sound good in the process or whatever. Yeah. The other car, I kind of want it to be a bit difficult to drive, like not have tons of grip, make great noises, all that yeah. sort of stuff, look cool. But like it needs to, everything needs to be kind of a bit difficult because that's when you start to enjoy it. Like yeah. well, in terms, not, yeah, I think so. I don't want to break down any of that stuff, but just navigating a wet corner becomes a bit more interesting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, 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 my, I read this the other day and got told on Twitter that I was wrong uh, by a lot of people. My favourite, even though it's just my favourite car of the last <laughs> decade. You're wrong. My favourite car. The, yeah, you, that's not your favourite car. Well, all right. Okay, <laughs> fine. All right. Um, uh, he's, he's the, he's the a Toyota GT86 and Subaru BRZ Ooh. combo. I just really like them. I think, you know, there are faster cars. There are more comfortable cars. There are more fun cars, arguably. There, there are better cars, but I like the fact that full of fuel, it weighs 1,230 kilos, uh, it runs on two on five section tyres, um, is a manual, naturally aspirated, 53% weight distribution to the front, and it's small. And I like and I like that. That's what I like, you know, and it's fully, yeah, I know it's flawed, you know, I know it's only got 200 horsepower and, you know, you've got a rev it and you know, so what, what else am I doing? But, you know, but, but that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's good. So, um, yeah, I, I like, I like cars that give me something to do and that ergonomically are sound and like you say, you know, are, are capable enough and competent enough, but still manage to engage you at, at road speed, at road speed. So you don't have to be going 30,000 yeah. miles an hour to get the best out of them. I think I, I, I've got a, a Yaris GR coming in, Oh, not, super. not ordered, um, mm. as in I get to drive one. Someone they're mm. lending me one for a week in in about two weeks. But I think I think I saw your post saying I, about the um, GT eighty six, and I've been talking to someone else about cheap uh, car. Like, well, cheap is relative, but cheaper mm. compared to loads of expensive stuff and cars that might be fun for a track and occasional use car. Mm. And the GT eighty six keeps coming up. Yeah, and. And then I saw your post and I thought it was a good one to talk about because it is, it, it does, I've not driven one and I might, I'm going to ask Toyota if I can drive one after, after yeah, it's this. Worth, because it's, it's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. I drove one last, I drove one last week for a sort of, we're writing a, a goodbye feature for it mm. because the last, the last one has just been sold in the UK before the new one arrives. And I, you know, I won't pretend it's perfect because, well, I mean, I no car is perfect, but when you drive it, I sort of, sort of drive it and think, you know, what, I wouldn't mind if the gear stick was a little bit lower. I'd like a deeper dished wheel to come out to me a bit. I'd like to sit a bit lower. Yes, it wouldn't hurt if the engine was a bit smoother. Although I'm told somebody who's got a BRZ says actually they, they bought some kit for like 40, 50 quid on the intake, which has made a big difference oh, okay. to the power delivery. On a track, um, I like, I enjoy them on track. Some people go, uh, you know, sort of, lower them a bit and put them on bigger, fatter tyres. But I, I, I don't know. The, it's great in slower corners. In fast corners, you are thinking about, yeah, some, you know, it, I'm waiting for something to happen. <laughs> you know, straights take quite a long time. Some yeah. guy wrote to me and said, it's too slow. I drove on at Laguna Seca and it was too slow. I'm like, well, it okay. probably wasn't designed with Laguna Seca in mind, mate, to be honest with you. Yeah, so of course it, yeah, of course it, you know, going up the hill towards the corkscrew probably took quite a long time. But um, if you enjoy it for what it is, um, whether it would be the perfect road and track car, it might want more power as a track car. I don't mm. think it needs any more as a road as a road car. It's, um, it depends also how you approach your track driving because if you're on and all over the limit every single corner, like that's way more fun than the straights are yeah. like yeah, pretty yeah, boring. Yeah. The straights are boring bits. Yeah, exactly. That's when yeah, you check your levels for a corner to happen. and yeah. call your mates and whatever. Mm. Like um, I've 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 done some racing in a. Citroen C1. Oh yes. <laughs> so that's got. Oh, yeah, I think we did. I think we did this. I was reading um, one of your posts. I think we did the same race. Yeah, the same. Did yes, you do, I think have we, you done I Spa or have you done Silver? I've done. I've done both. Yeah, I did. Uh, I did Spa for a. When was it? 2018, possibly. Yeah, and then I, I did, think that, I did yeah. Silverstone 2019. But I think so I it was really wet ways. at Spa. Yeah, yeah, it was really wet at Spa, <laughs> yeah. and then it was lovely at Silverstone. Yeah, and I. Yeah, it was. Yes, because even though. I had I had one of the best drives of my life in that in that Silverstone bit when the sun was coming up on the Sunday morning and the car was fine and the lovely thing about it is even though there were a hundred cars in the race weren't there 
because they're all the same speed, you might not see one for, for ages. Whereas I've done a brick car race at Silverstone as well with only, well, only 50, 50, 60 cars. And because the speed differentials are so huge between a Smart for Two going yeah. around and also a Mosler, <laughs> yeah, there's always something going on and it's usually quite a lot quicker or quite a lot slower than you. Whereas the Citroen thing was great because you just, you know, you, you're thinking about overtakes for about four laps. <laughs> You're just thinking, yeah. right, if I do this there, do that there. Yeah. And My Silverstone race, I think must have been a different one because it was pouring. Ah, uh, like, really? Like torrential downpour from the moment of Quali and Quali was at night. So <laughs> there's a whole bunch of people, I imagine, who, you know, a lot of people do that who've never raced before. Yeah, and their yeah, first yeah. experience of qualifying at night in the pouring rain it's just like it was carnage yeah i can believe yes i can believe it yeah it's um but yeah there is like you say this they handle really well don't they with the, with the, the things the c1 Set club well, have done yeah. to those cars they you know they are really you turn in and they start to move around a little bit and i just think yeah i think they're terrific and you just it's a very different sort of um i remember jan mardenborough saying uh you give one the uh, Nissan GT Academy, the PlayStation GT mm. Academy thing, and then became a, a race a race driver, raced a lot of GT cars. And he did Formula 3, and he said it's quite different to GT because the grip levels are massive and there's loads of aero, but there's hardly any power. So you have to be much, much more precise yeah. in the driving. And I thought, well, that sounds like Citroen C1, except the C1 doesn't have the power, the aero, <laughs> or the, the handling, <laughs> or the steering, or the grip. But I take but I take what it doesn't, what it doesn't have is the straight, you know, you can't power your way out of trouble. Right. So you have to be you know, millimetrically precise or you, or you get overtaken, which I do a lot. And you've got yeah. time when you're, when something goes wrong, unless you get it massively wrong, you've got time to work out or you're going around a corner, yeah. the corner, you're in the corner for a long time and you, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can yeah. just tiny, you can like, you can really learn. I think I really learnt a lot racing mm. that car because you can experiment and play with the angles and stuff. Uh, exactly of the steering wheel. You're like, okay, an extra four degrees. Oh no, that's, scrubbing a little bit yeah and then you take that back into driving something really fast and it yeah i think you're right i think you're right i think it's probably like driving in slow motion a bit isn't it, it is, is that you manage yeah. to break down because i certainly would get closer to the limits of a c1 of the close closer to the the potential of what a c1 can do much closer to that than i could a, a gt3 car or something like that you know yeah, i get i would same. get in a gt3 car do five laps be nowhere near it whereas if i spent five laps in a c1 i get out and go yeah i got you know i got most you know, I've got most of the things out of that. It's a bit like, um, maybe it's a bit like, uh, I think Clarkson wrote this in the early 90s in performance car. It's a bit like playing tennis. You know, if you play somebody really good, you'll just get caned. Whereas actually, <laughs> if you play somebody at your level, you'll have a great game. Um, and yeah, you know, my, my level is not single seaters and GT3 cars and stuff like that. My level is much, my level is much yeah. lower where I have a much more fun and get much closer to it. And I think the, you know, the closer you can be to a car's limits um, and enjoy it, the, the more fun you get out of it, I think. A hundred percent on road, on track or whatever. Mm. And I think those do diverge significantly. The more you add a sort of prototype aero element to yeah, it, like the difference so. between, oh, I mean, okay. In the C1s, it's, 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 it's amazing how slow some people can go. Like, uh, like it's surprising, like isn't it? Forty five seconds yeah. of pace or something. Yeah. But you get in it and you might be like you think you've absolutely nailed it. You're quicker than most people, and then someone who's like a legit pro gets in and they're still two seconds faster. And you're yeah. like, I don't understand. Yeah, where does that come from? That's but yeah, that's what it's, I yeah. It's tiny, tiny, tiny. And the laps are like f four minutes or something. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so the spa lap was percentage. amazing, isn't it? Yeah. But yeah, a, yeah, um, how far I feel a prototype, yeah. like a a, a P two car or something, you're gonna be if, if you're pretty good, you could still be 10 seconds off. You could be yeah. eight, like eight, yeah. six, something like that off a pro pace because mm. those tiny bits mean a lot more. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And I don't know where that comes. I don't know where that comes from. That's the other thing, you know, is it quite a, sometimes I'll drive that thing, something really quick and think, yeah, I've gone quite fast in that, but I don't know where the rest of it, you know, so, and then somebody will say, well, here's your lap time and here's our professional driver's lap time. And you think I could spend all the time in the world it, in this car and I would never make it, I would never make up that time. That, it's, and that's it's crazy. the constant frustration, isn't it? Of, of just not, you know, driving, driving a lot, driving on track a lot and still being relatively that bad at it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, that's something I, cause I've had quite a bit of instruction over the years and it's an on, ongoing process. Mm. And I, I drive a radical every now and then. Um, 
And do you race? Do you race that? Or do you? Tend I to do I have done test sessions. I I raced the SR1, so the little oh, one. Yeah, okay. For, I did yeah, two yeah. seasons of that, um, and then I've done a couple of races in the three. But I'm not up to the pace that I want to be. Mm. I want to be able to set like a I don't know top five quality time or something. And until I can do a lap within that pace, I don't. I'm not that interested in racing that oh, car. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cons- yeah. Okay. Consequences of racing that car and you get it wrong. Uh, Oh, more, yeah. more expensive than yeah. you see one. Um, mm. And I don't, if I can't get, if I don't have the pace, yes, you might get a bit faster in a race, but I'd rather just work on my pace and then I think that's come fair. back. Yeah, but I think that's fair. you sit down with a, a coach and you go, oh, I'm like two seconds off. And they're like, yeah, okay, but let's take Silverstone. It might, I don't know how many corners it has. Let's say it's got 12 corners. That's an absolute guess. No idea. Mm. Um, and you might be a 10th off or one to two tenths off on this corner, one tenth off. Now a tenth, it's not a lot. It's not, is it? No, it's but not. If you've when you've got you work ten it corners, out, it's a second. Yeah, when you yeah when you work it out in percentage terms, and also you may not be very much off in the corner, but actually by the time you get to the end of the next straight, that might have extended a bit further, and you've you know your mistake's been there, but actually yep. you know it's just compounds. But there's you know it's a very very tiny error here that ends up being you know I've done it. You go on a circuit somewhere and just see somebody walking away from you down the straight and it's just like what have i what have i done what have i done wrong in that corner that you're now just so yeah. in a go-kart obviously it's because the go-kart is crap and <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. come on look come and they're on. really why light got, why have you given me this piece of <laughs> crap you know but um yeah exactly and they weigh nothing you know obviously they're only you know four foot four foot four so yeah of course they're quicker than me but um yeah yeah yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah but it's i, I see what you mean one. yeah i can see what you mean but you, you, you'd want to be I, had I watched a, the sorry, no, I, Karen. I was going to say I watched the Australian Supercars Championship, which I like uh, a great deal. And they have a, a, a they have a it's effectively a sort of silhouette series. So the the engines are uh, people make their own engines, but they're very close to spec. The chassis is is to, is to spec, and um, the difference between first and twenty fifth on the grid is some on a short track is sometimes less than a second. Amazing. You just think, crikey, if you've been round and you go. You know, your engineer goes on the radio, yeah, good news is seven tenths off pole. You go, oh, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> Bad news is you're 21st. <laughs> you sick Christ alive. How they can drive that so consistently. And that's what gets me about, you know, the, about the pros, that they can drive it so consistently. So they can get so near to a car's limit and they can, you know, they can all do it. And it's, uh, yeah, it's an enviable skill. But yeah. As a sort of gentleman driver, I can get, there'll be a, you know, I can get closer and closer and closer and closer and there'll be a point in time where you might be really close to their pace. Like you might be two tenths off or something. But the thing is with them, they can do that in any car, on any day, on yeah. any track, in any condition. You're like, oh mm. man. Yeah, that's just yeah. a whole different ball game. It's a different, it is. Yeah, it is. But it comes with practice. The Okay, I had a question for you. The auto car car of the year or the concept of car of the year Mm-hmm. It gets watched, read, all these sorts of car of the year type things. A few magazines do it, that sort of thing. Now, I sort of look at it and I understand why it has to be the car of that year, like a car yep. made in that year. But fundamentally, like if I'm, let's say I'm a buyer mm. and I want the best driver's car available now, that possibly won't be a car that's come out that year. So we, yes. So we get these sort of competitions between a bunch of cars when they're not necessarily the spiritual competitor of that car. For example, I don't know, the McLaren 765 is not competing against the Pista or the F8, whatever that will be. Yeah. Or you don't get the direct, it's not a level playing field in terms no, of No, I don't the I do yeah, I do know what you mean. So we when we do it, we invite the previous winner um back. So mm. so so to an extent we you know we have we you know what you should have, you should have the best driver's car on sale in the competition because if it comes back and wins again, gets invited back. Now the problem sometimes is that it goes especially if it's like a Ferrari or a McLaren, it goes out of production quite quickly. Yeah. So the next year you go, oh, yeah, you can, and you could have it back, but we don't make it anymore, mate. So you know, we haven't got one. Um, but yeah, the so the idea the idea behind behind ours, and I think I think most people sort of performance car of the year, if you like, is that they say, well, you know, if you have a Monday O wagon, 
as your everyday car and you could pick any one of the others as the car that you would like to drive for fun, which is that, which is that going to be? And the nice thing about it is it's not always the most expensive and it's not always the fastest. So we have the Aerial Atom 4 uh, win our com- contest and the, the, the th- it almost feels like a slightly unfair competition sometimes because you get in the Atom and all you're doing is driving and it weighs <laughs> 550 kilos. You know, how does a Porsche 911 Turbo S compete with that? And I do, yes, I do take your, I do, I do take your point, but you know, I, the nice thing about deciding on a driver's car is that I think it can transcend those, those barriers and those boundaries. Um, and, uh, and at some point during the year, we will have tested that new, that new yeah. M2 or 765 or whatever against, against its level, uh, against its level competitors. So, but I think it, it feels worth doing. It feels one of those things that is worth, feels worth doing. And weirdly, they don't all, those, those features don't always sell magazines. I know we're not the only ones to, to, to discover yeah. if you put them front and center on the cover. I think it used to be different. I mean, we've been doing that for what we call uh, Britain's Best Driver's Car, which sometimes was called Handling Day because it focused on vehicle handling at some point. Mm. We've been doing it for over 30 years and it used to be, you know, one of the biggest selling issues. But I think maybe there's a kind of supercar tiredness and stuff like that in the readership. I know a lot of mags, if they put it front and centre on the cover, it's not going to be actually, the, it's not going to be a, a necessarily yeah. a big selling mag. Um, but it still feels like it's it's worth doing for us and it's a worthwhile exercise because you find out a lot about cars very quickly and you can tell the reader basically a lot about the best cars to that have been launched that year yeah quite do you have you had any resto mods in it not yet no um i don't think i don't think so no we haven't we've done sort of uh, all that's difficult it hasn't occurred to us but it is is an interesting thought because i suspect if we had a an alpha holics gta arm in it would have done really well and that cyan racing thing would have done uh, yeah. would have done really well as well so yes mate so maybe we maybe we will maybe we will but deciding on when it's new and how new it is and whether it's new enough and whether it's available in sufficient sort of quantities you know because we don't is that part of the that of, but that well, i mean it's it's not a, it's not a definite criteria but i think it's on somebody it would be in the back of somebody's mind if somebody said well how about we invite a long Oh, I don't know. The Global Motors, think of it, Bob. They're going, they're going to make one of them. Yeah. And they're a million and a half quid. You think, oh, do you want to, do we, do we put that in? Because, I've, yeah, I don't know. You know, valid. I think it depends. Yeah. I think it sort of, uh, it, it depends slightly on the credibility of the, of the company and yeah, so on yeah. and so forth, you know. You could also flip that one though sometimes and go, not, not pistas, because there was quite a few of them. But mm-hmm. if you now want a GT3, you want a GT3 RS, a Touring, yeah. something like that, if you don't buy it secondhand, it's, it's very, very, very hard. Yes, it is. Yeah. And it's, uh, we certainly have had that, you know, we've had that conversation about, especially when you, you know, if I think about uh, probably McLaren wise, I think, you know, when you say, um, I think the 600 LT might have won our contest a couple of years ago. And I, and, you, and then the next year comes along and you can't buy it anymore. So do you, yeah, do you have that? And I think, I think, it, I think how it came about, they said, well, we don't, but we've introduced the spider since. So why don't you put that in? Yeah. Um, so yes, there, and when we had the similar with a, with a Ferrari, I think probably actually the 488 or possibly the piece to which one, and then it wasn't on sale the next, you know, wasn't on sale the next year. So what do you, you know, what do you, yeah, what do you bring along? A, it is, it is a, th- yeah, it is a, it is a, it is a discussion point, certainly. Yeah. And there's it's only and testing cars and it, you know, it's only messing exactly. And, it's only, and I just it's said, telling stories, you know, so it's, you know, so it's fine. <laughs> And and as you mentioned, you do put these cars against each other at other points yeah, in time. Yeah, generally, um, yeah. I, I want to do just a, this might be a, a, a quick fire. If you were spending, it, picking a car from these categories, what would you buy? And, oh, I'm, okay. and I'm going to ignore the usual thing of it has to be a new currently on sale. Oh, okay. I'm, I'll maybe say within the last... Yeah, no, actually, no, I'm going to ignore the new currently on sale. So ever, Just, ever. It, it, but it's a similar sort, of, similar sort of price brackets. Okay. So available now, as in you could go and buy one secondhand and it would fit within this price bracket. Okay. Uh, so, okay, the first one doesn't actually have a whole price bracket, so that's not very helpful. But if you were going to buy a hot hatch right now, which one would you buy? The, it would be a, it'd probably be a GR Yaris, I think, Ooh. right now. Yeah. And would you take would you, it? To, oh, well, I mean, is it, would you call it a, a rally replica? That's the thing. 
I think it's, I think it fits in the hot hatch. Or could I go and buy uh, who is it? Tolman who's remaking those Lotus Sunbeams. Oh, I've not seen that. Oh, they, they, they I, I was a bit of a soft spot for the toy, for the, <laughs> for the Talbot Lotus Sunbeam, and I think yeah, there's there's a place now which is doing it basically a, a sort of resto modi kind of version of it. Technically, technically a hot hatchback, but it's rear wheel drive, so yeah, nice. even better. Be pretty yeah. fun. That looks quite yeah. fun. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's cool. Yeah, it's cool, that. isn't it? Um, um, but yeah, I think on sale, GI Aris is the, is, you know, the, 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 the car at the moment, moment, I think really. Yeah. Right. Family wagon. Um, I'm sort of thinking three series, a four, yeah, that, I'm, that sort of category, not probably a, yeah, probably a, th- that. probably a three series, maybe not brand, maybe not brand new. I'll tell you what, if, 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 if I can just go out is the, uh, the Bangle era five, 550i because that was a great engine, long, much longer range than an M5, and a much mm. better gearbox than an M5, and actually, as it, you know, as enjoy for me, as enjoyable, pretty much. I think that car's aged really nicely. looks really looks really good. And then I just want Apple CarPlay put in it. Yeah, and that's it. I, that's I'm pretty happy, much basically. my tick box. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, totally. Any car, yeah, totally. but have Apple CarPlay. Yeah. What's the <laughs> infotainment like? Well, it's got CarPlay. Yeah. yeah. So that's it. I'm done. Yeah, I'm happy. And and if I can, it, that is the difference between what is like. A brand new Porsche and one that's like ten years old is just does it have CarPlay? Yeah, does it have CarPlay? Yeah, <laughs> everything yeah. else and is not, pretty and much the same. And not yeah, exactly. And not nine nine six headlights. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Family SUV. Oh, new Defender. Oh yeah, okay. Which is a which is tremendous. Which is you know really tremendous. Um, yeah, really really good thing. Or if if it wasn't brand new, uh, Discovery Four. My problem with Discovery Fours is uh, the maintenance and, and upkeep, but I think they're a great they're a great shape. They've aged terrifically, and they get everything right that you that you should have in an a. They can tow three and a half tons, but you know they they've got square sides, massive windows, big mirrors, mm. so you can see them and place them on road and off really easily. They're so refined. The driving conditions, their driving positions, fantastic. They're just you know they're a stellar they're a stellar car. And I think if somebody said you know you can go out tomorrow and buy a big collection of cars. I'd spend quite a lot of time driving around in a, in a discovery four, but, um, but, but I know, I know a lot of people who've had them and some people go, no problems with my discovery four at all. Been perfect. And other people go, no, oh, it's been a disaster. <laughs> it's been a night. Yeah. They've just been constantly in and out getting stuff, getting stuff done. But that is, um, you know, look, you look at reliability surveys, some manufacturers tend to do very well consistently and some do not. And it's, and occasionally it's you get a, like a bad egg. It's just <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I think you get more um, more bad eggs with uh, with old discos than you do with old Other stuff. Yeah. Toyota Land Cruisers, for example. I love a Land, I love a Land Cruiser. I think it's t- I think they're terrific. But I've just got a big big soft spot for the, the Disco Four, really. And um, yeah, but yeah, yeah. A new Defender's mega because it does everything. It's maybe a bit wide. It's quite big. The, yeah, yeah. But but you know the good thing is visibility is good enough. It's not a it's not like driving a Q7 where the window line is mm. is quite high and you can't necessarily see all the edges. At least in the Defender, you you feel like you're sitting on it and you can place it much more, much more. Yeah, you've precisely. got the corners. The mm. I, it was, it was, I don't know why this came up. It was a friend had a couple of year old Range Rover and it started mm. to go wrong and and he was like, oh, I'm just going to sell it. <laughs> and or I, I think he fixed the bit that broke and then sold it because like it's going to get worse. And I was like, well, yeah. if you then change to another car that. You yeah. have no idea of the history, yeah, really. Yeah, you don't know what's going to go wrong, like, do you? No, exactly. If, if you fix something on a car, you know at least that it's not going to break yeah. for a while. Yeah, so exactly. I yeah. think a lot I've of people a, do that every now and then. They, you know, they get a car, they do. Yeah. something breaks, they're like, oh, I better get rid of it. But you're yeah. taking on a whole new problem when you get another car, unless it's a new exactly. one. Exactly, and you don't know anything. And I, we, unsurprisingly, we quite get asked what, uh, I quite get asked what, what I think people should buy. And they say, you know, I want something that doesn't go wrong. And I think, well... Just keep what you've got then, you know? Yeah. But, but, but the nice thing about cars is people want a change because it's something they like. Yeah. You know, they get attracted by the product. They get attracted by, you know, the appeal of a car because it's not a, if nobody writes to me and goes, ah, oh, you know, well, I don't, I don't imagine people write to consumer fridge journalists where somebody writes to them and goes, <laughs> bit of a problem with a motor on my fridge. I've had it fixed. I've decided to buy a new one. What do you think? You know, you just, but actually people like, you know, until your fridge breaks, you don't, tend to get a new one, I think, until the old one's shagged. Whereas with cars, people just go, oh, I, just, I just want a new one because I like the idea of having something that's exciting, you know, that's interesting. But um, yeah, I've got an old, I've got an old Defender 90 and it still has the ability to present large 
builds. Yeah. Because it just does. Okay. Just, I've got, it just does. In the, let's say, in the auto car office. Yeah. Uh, do many people buy new cars? No, because we're staff journalists and we don't get <laughs> enough. No, um, but also, you know, you guys. No, not a lot, not a lot. Well, some, yeah, some people do, some people do actually, it's, or, or thereabouts, but it's, it's funny, isn't it? Because most people buy cars on finance. And I think partly because we tend to run cars for work. Uh, so, you know, you'll have something around for a week or for a few weeks, but you tend to be in something most of the time. So you don't have the need to go and buy a new car. Um, but some people, you know, some people do for, for, their, for their families and stuff. You know, they will have a family set of wheels. And they tend to be, you know, we've had somebody buy a Mini. Uh, somebody else has got a Mazda CX-5. So, yeah, there are, there are, but my, there are cars around. My point on that was, it's, it's just because I was talking to someone about this, is like new mm-hmm. versus nearly new. Like, oh, okay, yeah. Like, as in, like, when I look at cars now, the chance of me buying a sort of like a BMW 4 Series or, you know, some something that's sort of general cars-ish, not rare or special mm. or limited or whatever. The chance of me buying something like that new is really, really, really oh, slim. Yeah. Because I think, yeah, it's same here. so even expensive. If a, even if I had a proper job and uh, no other transport, I, yeah, I, I agree. M- uh, much more likely to buy something nearly new. But I do, I do sort of get it. I, somebody says, look, I've got a car, it goes wrong a lot, it's 15 years old, it's, well, I mean, it's 10 years old and it's worth three or four grand, but actually a dealer will take it in part exchange for a new car and then I'll just pay 200 quid every month. And in three years' time, I give it back and I get something else. And I don't really own the car ever. And you've spent... I just pay 200 quid every month. Over six but if grand. anything goes wrong, yeah. But if anything goes wrong, it's not your problem. It's not your problem. So I kind of get why, I kind of get why people... It's not, it's, it's not what I'd do. But I do kind of get why, why some people do do, do it. And they I just, totally you know, see well, it at the, the... It depends on the amounts. But like... Yes. Yeah. The lower amounts, I totally see it. Because you, you mm. know you've got a fixed you've got a fixed amount of payment or whatever, whether it's got a warranty, all of that sort of stuff. But then the, as the cars get more expensive, I see it a lot. And I just, I think it's, it just seems odd sometimes. It's people and everyone has, everyone makes their own decision, whatever. But if you buy like a, yeah, let's just say a, a four series. I'm mm. not particularly picking on BMW or whatever, but if you bought a new four series and you ran it for three years, you could easily, that could easily cost you nearly 20 grand or something yeah. like that. If yeah. you, even if you financed it or not financed it, because you're paying for it one way mm. or the other. And if you turn around to that person at the end and say, are you, are you happy having spent 20,000 pounds yeah. to now not own a car <laughs> and have yeah. had a new car? It just Did seems... you get 20 grand's worth of fun out of it? Yeah. That's difficult because, you know, you can get quite a lot of, yeah, would you, would you have been happier buying cars at two grand? chucking them away when, you know, when, when they present a very large bill and doing it again and then spending the remaining 15 grand you didn't spend having quite Track a nice time. Track days, renting, whatever, yeah. go on holiday, yeah, yeah. all these sorts of things. Yeah. It's just, it's an interesting one. I do take, yeah, I do take point. I am surprised how many new cars get sold every year. And I do, I wrote some of my column the other week, I, it, I don't think it would be, it would be bad news for the industry, but I don't think it would be bad news for consumers or the planet if the amount of cars that were sold every year was a bit lower, you know, it's, yeah. if we, if we got a bit more use out of the cars that we have, you know, if toaster sales, you know, it's, it's bad, it's, it's presented as bad news because new car sales fell by 600,000 in the UK last year. You know, we only sold whatever, 1.8 million cars rather than yeah. two and a half million cars in the UK. And whereas if somebody turned around and said that in the last year, toaster sales were down by a third, I don't think anybody would go, God, that's all, that was awful. Poor old toaster yeah. industry. You know, you just go, oh, well, fine. Good. Maybe that toasters, toasters are more toasters reliable. Are <laughs> yeah, maybe toasters are getting more reliable. Great. So, um, so yes, although I, 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 like, I have many friends and colleagues in the, in the car industry, um, it, you know, it's, again, bad car sales is, is bad for them. I don't think it's necessarily a terrible thing overall if fewer cars were, especially crap cars. Yeah. If fewer of them were sold, you know, if people liked them a bit more, bought something they want, they actually genuinely wanted and kept it. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it is an interesting one. And it was brought, brought on by, I'm reading this book at the moment. It's called, I think it's called like, it's about working with your hands and the benefit of like actually doing stuff versus mm. sitting at a computer. And one of the, 
bits they talk about is, is just sort of a bit of history of production of cars back in the day. And apparently when you factories started coming along and people were working in factories and they realized that people would only be so productive until they satisfied all their needs. So for example, they're, you know, you work and then you're like, you know what, I can buy food, I can have a bit of fun, I can pay for my house, I'm good. And they realized mm -hmm. they hit a point where they couldn't get people to sort of work harder and harder because everyone had satisfied all their needs. Oh, I see. And then, so they flipped it and then they started advertising on the consumer side and financing and they started marketing products that make, you know, like things that are more expensive that people want to buy. They put them on finance. So then people need to earn more money to keep, so then they work harder to keep, to keep sales up. Yeah. And finance on cars, it makes, it's very easy to get drawn into. I've yep. done it. Everyone does mm -hmm. it. Some good situations, some bad situations, but you end up buying things and cars are, you know, very expensive for yeah. everybody. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, their, totally. Yeah, totally. it's a major yeah. purchase. Mm. And then we all end up going down this finance route of buying something before we've earned the money for it. <laughs> Yeah. And then it's hard to get out of it, isn't it? Then you're, you know, you're in, you're in the, you know, you're, you're on the, you're on the conveyor belt, aren't you? You, you keep going you, and you have to keep walking. Otherwise, you know, what do you, how do you get off? How do yeah. you get off of it? Because, you, you know, your three year PCP comes up. You've got a little bit of capital left in the, you know, in the, in what the car, what you owe and what the car is worth. And that becomes your deposit on the next one. The alternative is you give the car back, you get a couple of grand back and then you go and buy something old and not as nice as what you've just had. Yeah. And that's, yeah, yeah, and that's, that is, well, I suppose that's how, you know, that's how, that's how it goes. That's how modern it's, consumerism modern goes, isn't it? Works, isn't it? Which, yeah, which is not, it, it's not how I like to, to buy, to buy cars, but I can, I don't know. I mean, I forget what a McLaren 570S was when it came out. I think the deposit was like 30 grand and then it was a grand a month. Yes. You think actually that brings it, if somebody's got a two year old M3, it does bring it into a lot of people's, you know, or a five, five totally. year old, 10 year old 911. It brings it into a lot of, you know, with a thousand, you like it, I'll get it for McLaren. Wow, what a thing. Um, but then you get the fallout of that. Not, yeah. not, I'm not ignoring the buyer now. Now let's talk the manufacturer in this scenario. There was a few cars, let's say, uh, yeah, like your McLaren, Aston Martin Vantage. There's mm -hmm. a, a bunch of cars you could get uh, 600 LT. You could get really quite like, good deals on a new one mm. if you financed it. Yeah. And all of these cars have come back around, hit three years and everyone's gone, okay, I've that's cost me 30K over three years or whatever it is. I'm fine with that, but like you can have it back. And yeah. the dealers get them back and they're worth a hundred grand and they've yeah. effectively bought a car back for 150. It's a real problem. Though. Yeah. For, manuf for manufacturers, that is a, yeah, that depreciation is a big, not, not, not just, not just premium manufacturers, you know, Mercedes has decided it, yeah. it needs to sell fewer cars, especially at the low end, because A class has been in the top 10 selling cars in the UK for ages, you know, and you push them out and people love them and they, they come back and they want to swap it like a smartphone. And then the dealers have got what, however many A classes they've sold it, like 60,000 A classes a year yeah. they sell in the UK alone. And dealers have got to get rid of them. And, you know, for a, for a premium manufacturer that sells on its cars being high quality and worth a lot of money, as a resale, they're not. They they become as ubiquitous as mainstream models, you know. Yeah. And I wonder, and I do wonder how long you can you can um, maintain a premium badge if you're churning. I mean, it seems to be quite a long time if you're churning out as many cars as somebody who's not a premium manufacturer. And that's where it's really difficult for those manufacturers in the middle who are who you know. Mondeo man used to have a Ford Mondeo. Yeah. Well, now he can have an A4 or a C class yeah. or many other many other premium alternatives. Um, so, crikey, they're going to have that, you know, because it's nicer and it's a bit. You know, it's not necessarily nicer to drive, not necessarily any better built, but it's got a better badge. And that's a that has been a real problem for manufacturers in the in the the squashed middle. You know, like uh, General, you know, Vauxhall Opel had a real problems making money in. Europe, Ford of Europe loses money as often as it makes money, and yeah, they make good they make good cars, but it's just really hard to sell car to sell mainstream cars and make money off it uh, in Europe. And you sort of think, well, somehow you've got a way of find a way of making money while selling fewer cars, and that's hard. That's really yeah, because it, it seems like at the moment you, a lot of money is made on the finance, yeah, rather than so. selling the yeah. car. 
So yeah, you, totally. know, you get contributions towards the price. So the, mm. the, the concept of that, which is great if you're buying it, but that you walk into a dealership and they're like, oh, but if you buy this car, we'll give you six grand towards your finance. You're like, what? Yeah. Why well, didn't you just well, put the price be, down? Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, funny enough, uh, funny enough. So when Vauxhall and Opel were sold to PSA, as it was before that, became Stellantis when it mm. absorbed Fiat Chrysler as well. Uh, the new boss of Vauxhall, Stephen Norman, said, um, he came in and he said, uh, right, what are you doing? What are you selling insignias on? And they're like, well, we're doing this, you know, we're discounting for fleets by X amount. He said, well, why are you doing that? Who do you think is going to buy this car at 30% discount? Who isn't going to buy it at a much less discount? And if you sell a few more of them, so if you, so if a slight, you know, if you sell slightly yeah. fewer, you offset that from the fact that you're suddenly making money out of, out of them. And um to their, to their great credit, you know, PSA turned around Vauxhall Opel very quickly and are now, you know, profitable within Europe. And they and I think out of the last nineteen years before that, they'd been loss making for all but two years. And now they've under good management, you know, they've they've um really sorted it out. And uh I don't know, GM just didn't didn't get I just didn't didn't get Europe as far as I can yeah. tell, you know. So it's it's mad. That you, and you see it a lot of like companies that go, whether it's Uber or whatever, you know, they're like, oh, we turn over X and we make a loss. And you're like, I don't, yeah, like ignoring it's the sort of tech side of it, eventually. but like, yeah, how just make if you're making a loss and you're selling a hundred million cars, why not just make one and sell it <laughs> yeah. for more than it cost yeah. you? Because <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You'd lose less money yeah. by not making any, honestly. You so, literally yeah, would. It's bizarre. Yeah, it's bizarre. No, it's mad. Right, let's continue on with these little quick fires. You've okay. got 40 to 60 grand to buy a sports car and you can buy any sports car. You can buy a new, oh, one, any time. new one or like a 10-year-old one or whatever. Best Excuse sports me. car oh. that one could buy right now. Right now. You know, Brand auto new. trader or whatever. No, you can oh, get it second uh, hand. I would, I'd probably, uh, it'd be quite difficult to look beyond a Porsche 911, wouldn't it really? Maybe Audi R8s would be, would be cool. 40 to 60. And the reason how I say- a Cayman, How expensive a Porsche Cayman R's? Are they under 40? <sighs> they are- Because they're yeah, mega. I think they're just about, yeah. Well, let's call it, let's call it that. I'd go for, I would go for one of those or an aerial nomad, which I don't know if that counts as your sports car thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is more fun, well, in that case, one of those, because that's more fun than I've had in a car for donkey's years. I think yeah. they're great. I think they're really terrific. Uh, I, it's, it's a car I would love to drive. It looks hilarious. Just oh, looks. it's just amazing. It's extraordinary, you know, because the, the body moves around a bit because it's quite tall and it's on, you know, mm. soft uh, dampers. But the, you just watch that you sit there and watch the wheels go up and down and they move <laughs> so quickly that it's just, and you just sit there and you're completely impervious to all of it going on on the gas. And the off road, they're great fun too. Yeah, they're just, and they don't weigh, I mean, they weigh more than an atom or, or a caterer or not something. A lot. But they're such good fun. They're such good fun. They're still sub 800 kilos, I think. So, yeah, I think, and there's, and they're manual, loads to do loads to amuse yourself with, you know, unassisted steering, unassisted brakes. It's great. Yeah. Thing. I think that, that sort of category of question in terms of is, is much more applicable to the way most people I know buy a car. They go, I've mm. got a budget of this and I want to get a sports car. What am I going to buy? And you go, yeah. okay, you could have a four year old that, or you could have a new this or a two year old that four year old might be slightly less reliable. It might have to get a warranty. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you do yeah. all those things and then, Put together the car. So yeah. 100 grand for a sports car. 100 grand for a sports car. If it were new, I would say you'd buy a 911, 992. Although they are a bit, um, I really enjoy them. They're great on track and they're very smooth on the road. I, I'm i not sure they give as much back on the road as right. they as, the, as, as, as older 911s do. But you did just say um, you wouldn't, you're very unlikely to buy a new car. I would be very unlikely to buy a new car. I, so, so 100 would grand, I would buy a... Probably quite an old, probably an older nine eleven is what I would buy. I think. I don't know what hundred. I'm trying to think what, what you can what get for hundred grand. What kind of you could yeah, get an AMG of, GTR. Yeah, I wouldn't. I like them. I mean, I like them, but I I wouldn't. Yeah. You could have yeah a bunch of Porsche. You could have an, a nine nine one turbo. Yeah, I like them, but I wouldn't. Um, I would go. I would go older if I could. I would go. Yeah, I think older. Uh, is what I'd, is that? I'd, I'd probably nine six. How much, how much are sort of like 964 turbos? They, have they gone stupid? Uh, they too I, much? I think the turbos might be quite a lot. Yeah. I'm not sure. I like 964s. Like they, were, they, were, they, were, they were good fun. 
I like those. Yeah, it's really. tricky. It's but it might tricky. be that they might be, but, but there's, well, there's so many cars. There's so many cars. I would open uh, classic cars for sale or classic and sports car uh, and spend dive weeks in there, lost in it. Yeah, totally. Alpha <laughs> SZ. There you go. They're not a hundred grand yet, but it would be nice to have some contingency because you'd probably have to get body panels 3D printed because they don't. Make, they just don't make them. But I love the. I've never driven an SZ, but I love them to bits. Yeah. Um, and they on my. I. I. Yeah. I. I they were. They used to be almost. They've, they're one of those cars that have always been slightly out of reach. Yeah. Because they were, you know, when I was when I was young, they were like twenty five grand or whatever. And then they went up to thirty, and they just keep going. They just keep going, keep going, yeah. keep, keep going. You know, just think, no, still unattainable, still unattainable, <laughs> still unattainable. But yeah, it may, but I just think they're, I just think they're so cool. I've never driven one. They might be terrible, but <laughs> yeah. like they, they look cool. They're very cool. Yeah. Uh, okay, next next one, two hundred grand, sports car. <laughs> Oh, uh, oh no, how, no, they're probably even more than that. I was going to say 964 RS, but they're probably more than that, aren't they? I, oh, yeah. I, probably, that's another one I don't know. Maybe yeah, 250? Uh, yeah, uh, 200 grand. Lamborghini Countach. Can you get them for 200? Or am I wishful thinking on that? I think there's a lot of wishful thinking. they were 50 grand at some point. Yeah, but just, a lot of cars were cheap at one yeah. point. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this category is like, essentially, and, and, and ish, it's like you could buy... A couple of the, the, you know, you could buy an F8. Uh, you yeah, I, well, you I'll tell you what, actually, yeah, a or mid-engined, you mid-engined, buy Ferra- stuff. mid-engined, yeah, mid, a, mid, a new-ish mid-engine Ferrari would be very good fun. That would be a really good way of spending 200 grand a year, except the fact that you may not get it all back. Yeah. So you'd, but you'd want to spend less than 200 grand, I think, on one. But they're, ter- yeah, they're terrific. Um, but I would probably look older. You are not far weirder. off an 812. I wouldn't. I like Fair. I like I like them, but I yeah, but I wouldn't. Too much, too much engine, too much wide, too much. A great engine, but no, too much for me. Too just. Is it a sports car? Yeah, it's a good question. It's, it's, it's a, a, GT it's a car. super GT, I suppose. But it, it but is it? A, yeah, is it? A, it technically, it's a, of course technically it's a sports car. You know, it's a V twelve Ferrari. Of course it is, but it's not what I'd be looking for. It's pretty big, long, yeah. long bonnet. Yeah. Cool thing. Cool thing. Yeah, really cool. Yeah, really cool. And I love that. I love that they exist. I like the fact that people own them. I like the fact that people buy them. I think they sound amazing. I, you know, but um, I don't know how often I'd really enjoy using it on the road. And it's not a natural track car either, really. You know. Yeah. So, uh, My yeah. problem with the sort of that price bracket of cars at the moment is the one hundred and thirty grand seven twenty S. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's got like a couple of thousand miles, 130 grand. You're like, oh, you, it's like to spend so much more and, and, to get the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A terrific car, a really terrific car. And um, yes, there is the, it, it's the epitome of uh, what one chief exec from a different car company described to me as um, a butcher selling different lengths of the same sausage. <laughs> and, and, I get, and I get it, you know, they, they've had, we did a, a piece on uh, supercar sales the other day and a few dealers, you know, it was like McLaren have too many cars, too many cars that do a very similar thing. And, you know, the values do not hold up brilliantly. But like you say, when there's a, if, if you can get 720S for 130 grand, that's so much car for that much, yeah. for that relatively little money. It's you a know, great 130 buyers. grand isn't little money, is it? But it's, it's, a, it's a, an amazing car. Yeah. I have a, a friend who owned a 720S that he bought for one new. 70 something like that so it wasn't new but i think he sold it for like 130 so. yeah. he, that's a big hit to take he was he on. was he was aware and at the time and, but it was a funny whatsapp group where was, every now and then we'd just be like oh we found another one for sale at, at oh like, crikey yeah i'm five. sure yeah but he yeah. has just he's bought a 765 oh, well okay. aware that oh, he well, they're amazing i mean they are ast- they are astonishing no question uh, but but they do yeah they drive they drive in some ways like McLaren's they do have an inherent handling characteristic i think you know most mclarens do but the 765 is, is astonishing so steers brilliantly if you could go 765 versus the and there's, there isn't a ferrari equivalent at the moment no but which would you pick oh i'd say i think i would still have an f8 yeah. uh tributo just that, the regular f8 tributo what i um I wouldn't go as fast on a track, you know, you, if you took the lap times and we've, we've done it when we road tested them and group tested them and things like that. You know, if you take the contemporary McLaren and Ferrari, the, when they do rival yeah. each other directly, 
I think the McLaren has been quicker every time, but I would have preferred the Ferrari every time because it has, the McLaren steers better, uh, generally rides on the road with uh, flatter and, and a bit better, but because they fit, a, a, I think Ferraris have better throttle response. They have a, what seems to be a quicker acting gearbox and because they have a, an electronically controlled mechanical diff. limited slip diff, they can do stuff that McLarens don't do. The McLarens have a, they can brake steer into a corner so you can get the car turn that way and they have sufficient power that they can, you know, straighten themselves on the throttle. But I find maybe it's the way I drive them, but I'm not the only one to, to, to say it and think it. Sometimes you find that you're nudging up to the, to the point of understeer and you're starting to push through and only when the turbos start to spool do you eventually push through it and then you get a lot of oversteer quite quickly. Whereas the Ferrari, as you turn, it keeps the diff open and then as soon as you get back on the power, it mechanically starts to liven things up and they become a lot more agile mid-corner. And I, look, I know it, it, it's, it's tenths of a degree in terms yeah. of the amount of fun difference between the between the two but um i yeah i just i just like that it feels to me like each corner is a slightly more blank page um in the in in the ferrari so that's the way i yeah so that's the way i can pretty consistently would go but i'm not in a majority on my magazine and possibly not in the in the mm. business i think but you know but the but the people i <laughs> sort of you know i'm in various whatsapp groups and chat to other journalists there are a few and we go yeah we know we're right yeah, all of them they're all wrong but we know but we know we actually know um, so comp- yes that's which way i'd go there's a company putting uh putting diffs in mclaren's at the moment oh that's interesting uh, that is interesting litchfields are doing some on some 570s now that um, yeah now i would like to try that and apparently this new v6 hybrid does have one i'm told so well, well, well i don't well, that's know that's interesting sure, that's what somebody told me the other week rumor mill yeah what, okay, when I first heard about these new j- iterations of sort of that category of supercars, whether it was the f- the next Ferrari F8 mm-hmm. successor or this McLaren that's coming, which will actually probably be out by the time this podcast comes out. But yeah, I think we see it properly in a in not very long, don't we? Yeah, like a week for, for sure. Yeah, in my head, I was like, this could be amazing, and I was imagining a okay, they're doing six cylinder, fine, mm. whatever but a high revving naturally aspirated engine with some hybrid. Yes. And I thought that sounded like the ultimate, most amazing combination of all of these things because turbos are what turbos are. They're like, you yeah. lose a lot with turbos. Yes, you got more shove, but no one needs 860 no. horsepower, whatever no, the exactly. actual 765 is putting to the ground. But they're turbos. All of the, all of the ones I've, as far as I'm aware, they're all yeah, I, my understanding is the same, and I think it's an efficiency and CO two related related same. thing. Is that they, yeah, you still have to basically you still have to have a turbocharged car to to, to meet the emissions that you that you want to, and then the tur- then the hybrid will be there to torque fill, which worked brilliantly in the P one because that's a really high revving, high boosting thing. But actually, as soon as you it's the one McLaren actually that as soon as you get back on the power, you get the power you want mm. straight away, which ironically, even though it's the most powerful, is arguably the easiest to sort of mess around with on a track, you know, because yeah, you, yeah. Don't have to, you don't have to use all the throttle and you've got instant response there when you want it. Yes, but so yeah, but yes, it, I think it would be quite interesting to try and it's, and I'm not sure, I tried anything that's got a hybrid and not a turbo other than... Uh, there's some aftermarket other than, stuff. Yeah, other, but... than, other than, you know, other than main, you know, other than very mainstream you know, Toyota Prius does not have a yeah. turbo or did not have a turbo. No it sounded turbo. at one point you know, like so, the 992 might get it, but that's still going to yeah. be turbo. Yeah. And that seems to have, um, yes, because that platform could take, uh, could, was was built ready for hybridization when they, when they want to put it in. But it is, it, I haven't driven an SF90, but it is interesting. The idea that you can just suddenly get that torque fill very quickly. So you get the response you want straight away is quite, is quite appealing. Um, Okay, SF90, this is a good yeah. topic because I saw a video, there's someone in America that got an SF90 and a 765. Now we know mm-hmm. the 765 is not 765, it's more like 865 um, <laughs> in real life, but it weighs 1,250 kilos or something like yeah. that. The SF90 probably weighs 1,600, that's a guess. Yeah, I mean, maybe on the maybe on the rest by the time you've got yeah, because very quite, possibly. They, they so often quote dry weight, don't they? And and we you know when we put on the 
when we put them on the scales when we road test them, they're always quite a lot. Yeah, quite a lot more than that. So they did a yeah. he did a and only in America can, can you seem to get away with this sort of antics. But he did, they went to like an on ramp to a motorway. Or oh something yeah, well, why wouldn't you? Yeah, and sure. just did yeah. naught to a hundred and fifty or oh, something right. like that in both cars. And the camera's kind of pointed at the sky, so you can see the dash, and that's about it. Right. Uh, but they get away with the sort of thing in the States that obviously you'd get locked up for doing Yeah, and I think that there's some kind of, if you don't get stopped straight, because it's the same with the, um, oh, you know, the, the, the and stuff. cannonball thing going across this. Yeah, if you don't get stopped as you're doing it, they can't do anything for cannonball. Pretty is that, much, is that my I understanding? Think. Yeah. Yeah. But both the cars, right? The I think the SF90 naught to 60 was like 0.1 of a second faster, something mm-hmm. like that. But the it was like i think it was like 60 to 130 or 30 or something like that 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 sort of middle of the range gap mm. the lt was like 0.1 of a second faster uh, okay and i and people buy cars for all sorts of reasons but as someone who enjoys performance and mm. driving a car that is the same or quicker that weighs 1,250 kilos in his rear wheel drive versus a car that weighs what, like, I don't know, 400 kilos more four wheel mm. drive and is as quick. I just, I just don't see in what world you ever picking the SF90. No, I, yeah, I, I agree. The, you'd pick the lighter, you would pick the lighter one. I would pick the lighter one. It just makes more, yeah, it just makes more sense. But somehow, yeah, somehow the world doesn't. <laughs> well, yeah, always it's, agree with this, does it? But you're, you're right. I mean, I think lightness keeps giving, doesn't it? That's the thing, you know. Because if you can make it lighter, you don't need brakes quite the same size. You don't need an engine quite the same size. And you know, you the lighter you go, the lighter you know, the, the better off you are. So, and that's the you know, that's the thing. As even sports car manufacturers start to think, well, we need the ability to make our car drive under its own electric steam for a little while, because otherwise we can't sell them in cities which is where a lot of people for better or worse will drive them. Uh, mm. You know, that, that, that's, yeah, that is where we are. I'm not sure it's necessarily make it, there will come a point where, because I, I think cars have got better and better, largely. You know, the car yeah. you buy today will be better than one thirty, forty 40 years ago. But whether we've reached peak enjoyment in cars is uh, an interesting point. And I don't, and I don't know, maybe, maybe there is a, maybe there is a, a point of peak fun that we'll that we'll go past, and as cars, and until batteries get lighter, yeah, uh, and I, the technology gets better, you know, maybe maybe it'll maybe things will get duller for a while. It's a tricky one because, and I don't want to be one of those people, and I I think I'm not no, that same. says like no. cars are getting worse, and I don't think they are. I think what we have is we have regulations for certain reasons, mm. but I think if you if I could go out and say I don't know, I want a Porsche that is naturally aspirated i want it to be 1100 kilos or lighter Mm. like that sort of weight and it can have 500 horsepower and i want it to rev to like nine or ten and have a Mm. manual gearbox like i'd buy that and that you could make you could make something like that now which you couldn't do yeah 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 10 years ago and it would be safer and whatnot like yeah I want to see those cars. That I do. Yeah, I do. And I do and I wonder if I wonder if there are enough of us who do want to, you know, who do want to do that. If there are enough people know. like like that. And that's my thing. Cuz cuz we've come back to the resto mod, you know, you can you can do it and people will and there will be a big waiting list for those people. And the Gordon Murray uh, T50, you know, has shown that maybe it, you know, if he sells them all seems to be seems you know seems seems to be doing maybe it will be a bit of a message to some manufacturers that maybe they don't have to say here's the new car it's 10 percent heavier it's 10 percent more powerful it's 10 percent extra yeah than the previous one you know but it would be a brave manufacturer to to do it you know how does absolutely how does and can you know ferrari or borsche turn around and go great news we're launching a brand new car less powerful than the old one that's a you know that's 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 a hard place to be i, I think, think it, it goes against all of it I think there's scope for, let's say, Ferrari, for example, or McLaren. Let's pick McLaren because they put the same engine in all the cars. Not quite, yeah. but pretty much. Yeah, they will um, tell you it's definitely t- very different. <laughs> oh, it's very different. It's but they, 80% different. They are, chain, they, they are making, you, you've got your 720S. Let's just mm. say that's the current sort of production-y top one-ish. That, you can turn up the boost each year and it can get more and more powerful and it's the crazy yeah. one. 
But if the one that was in the middle, the 570 and whatever the next one's going to be called, if that, if they did it on that car, and, and it, like you said, it's, it's, I think it's a very difficult call for a manufacturer to make. But if they went, mm. you know what, let's make something that is really cool and what real sort of like driver e people, enthusiastic people want to do. Like a 911 Touring, for example, the manual GT3, I'm sure they sold yeah. more PDKs, but they did sell a lot of manuals and they, mm. the love for that car is significant. I think if McLaren turned around and made a super light manual transmission car with less horsepower that was lighter, I think they would sell a lot because they would get all the people would. that are just like wafting around and going, I could get, and then it's just, you just literally pick, pick a manufacturer and they all make the same car. Like they'll, yeah. they're, you know, they're different, but they're kind of very similar. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they tend to. And it's a very clever manufacturer who identifies a place where nobody else is. And it doesn't happen that, you know, it doesn't happen that, that often. The 911 used to sit somewhere where nothing else quite, quite did. I'm not sure it's necessarily true entirely anymore. But yeah, they were used to be really, really smart about that. Um, yeah, we, oh God, wouldn't it be good? It'd be so I do, good. I do, so I do good. think, I do, yeah, I do, I do think, I do think McLaren did say, you know, the boss did say, look, you know, if we ask, if we ask some of our potential customers, they all want a V12 and a manual gearbox. But actually, people who spend money on them, you know, yeah. not, there aren't enough people who'd spend big money on it. But I, I don't know. I think it's, I think the world is coming around a bit to that way of, I'd like to think. I think to you the, do to, a Gordon to this Murray. way of thinking. I think yeah. you just make the car. Yeah, just do it, just do it, build it and they'll come. Just Or build it yeah, or at least like say, you you know, put together a design study, whatever, work out what it's going to look like, release the specs and say who will order one. Yeah. Because I think yeah. a lot of these people that are going turning to resto mods are turning to resto mods because, well, one, they're kind of a bit cool, they're older, mm. but they have all this involvement we've talked about, all of these things. Like, you're just... You're losing that with the modern... The, yeah, I think uh, you're right. Who needs a car with 1,000 horsepower? What a joke. Yeah, there's only so fast you can go. And the, um, I was speaking to the chief engineer at Lamborghini at the launch of the Ventador SVJ, I think, and I said, you know, when's it going to finish? And he said, well, it, do it doesn't because you're, you're at the limit of tyre technology up to 100 miles an hour. Or at whatever, that weight. At, moment, or at, the, at that weight. So you can't accelerate any quicker now because you've got enough power to do that. What the extra power gives you is acceleration above... 120 hundred kilometers now, hundred miles now. Yeah, exactly. And so, so the more power you give it, the you know, the longer that shove continues. But does there come a point where that is irrelevant? You know, where that's irrelevant? Because it how many irrelevant. straights? There aren't any straights on racetracks long enough <laughs> yeah. to to benefit from it. You know, but you know, if you get a Auto Fuji bar. and you're still yeah, you get a Fuji and you're still accelerating at the end of it. Well, that's enough power. You know, that's how. So, what difference does it make? So, um, yeah, I'd like to I'd like to think there's a an end an end point to and that. And I wonder if, you know, 2000 horsepower electric hypercars might be it. And everybody goes, well, okay, fine. Well, that's, a, that's, that's it. That's the, that's the line in the sand. You don't need, you know, that's, you can't compete. Nothing with a petrol engine will ever compete with that no. level of power. So let's make petrol or synthetic fuel or whatever engines, if there would ever be a, a dispensation to keep selling. Yeah. And I don't think, cars, I think you know? the electric car is the ultimate, antithesis to the old school my car's faster than yours not to 60 because yeah, <laughs> because you're never going to be you're never going to be an electric any you know you're never going to be an EV. Lotus via you're never going to you know you're never going to get an internally combusted car that does it no. i was in a um i was in a i was in a, a ford mustang which had been through oh crikey i can't remember the name of the dealer in the uk that that that, that that does them and turns up turns up Mustangs quite I can't a lot. remember the name. Going, yeah, brings them over. Yeah, I was coming down a coming down a slip road onto the M40, and I accelerated a bit. And somebody in a Tesla Model X was behind me, who also accelerated a bit at the same at the same time. And I wasn't going. I wasn't going flat out, flat out. But you know, he it just you don't lose you don't lose that car. You know, it just sticks. You know, it just sticks. And he just well, I mean, you can't go flat out, flat out in a car that's got that much power because it's silly and dangerous. But you know, it's. You're using all of the available power in a car like that, and somebody behind you in an SUV is just going, "Well, yeah, I can, go, I can accelerate yeah. you if I want to," because um, <laughs> you, know, you just can. So, so where's the so where's the point? So just so, and that's the nice thing about those Mustangs is that they're good. They're good fun because you've got something to do. They sound they sound exciting. You know, you've got things to do. Yeah. They change character through the rev range, um, and yeah, it's that's that's more of that and less less horsepower. 
more and, and more. yeah, the, it, it all uh, it all just compounds. Like more power, yeah. you're like, okay, I'm gaining some acceleration when I'm going over 100 miles an hour. So mm. you're Ill- in the UK, it's illegal. Full stop. Been yeah. illegal for yeah, a long yeah, yeah. time. Yeah. And all you then have to do is um, was talking to in Litchfield about high horsepower GTRs, and it's mm-hmm. the same sort of thing. Like if you've got a car that's got 1500 horsepower, you've only got like what 45 degrees of throttle angle or oh, 50 you, you'd or hardly something use any yeah yeah and actually you, we d- yeah we did a feature colin goodwin wrote a feature for us on it and he took a mclaren and an mx5 to the same stretch of road and i think we might have borrowed the mclaren from me in litchfield actually mm. and, and measure and measured the amount of throttle travel that you use on the same on the set going down the same stretch of road and uh it was it was a startling difference between the two you know because it, it you can't, so you can't do it. Yeah. And yeah. therefore you've got, you've got 1500 horsepower and the same amount of travel versus 300 horsepower. So you have to be really damn careful with your foot of how much you move. Cause you could suddenly give it 1500 yes. and that's it. Like you then have to have all of these systems that are managing it and restricting torque. Like the idea of a car that restricts torque in the first three gears yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. You're like, yeah. what the hell? Then yeah. all the drive shafts have to be, thicker everything has to be heavier they put on bigger tires oh yeah no yeah but like you i don't want i <laughs> don't rid. want to sound you know like you i don't want to sound like one of these people who turns around and goes oh old cars are better because you know no things generally yeah, new things are better than you know as a rule new things are better than old things and i think that's true of, you know that's true of cars as well but yeah. but yeah i think there does need to be a some kind of you know thing and the problem is you Somebody launches a car like the GT86 or the Alpine A110, and then you look at how many they don't sell. <laughs> yes, compared to hot hatches with loads of power. You know, I um, is that's when it becomes a. You it's tricky, think, oh, isn't it? Why do you you know? But Alpine A110, personally, mm. with their auto gearbox in it, or, and it's it's a whatever double clutch. But that versus a manual, I, I me, I'm not buying it. Yeah, I I, t- I do take your point. I love the A110 because it's so little and it weighs 1080 kilos or whatever it is. Yeah. But yeah, I do wish, because uh, they said, look, we had the choice. We had a decent, we had the money for it to do it, to, to refine the decent uh, double clutch gearbox or we, or we, you know, had the money to do a bad manual. We decided to do the double yeah. clutch and you go, well, okay, if, you know, if that's what it, what it was, that's what it was. But I, yeah, I do, for that sort of car, I think they may have, it would be nicer with a manual. And it's, sure. it's a really tricky one because I think what we're seeing with the Yaris, for example, mm. is a lot of people are buying the Yaris as like, well, as a fun car. But I think there's a lot of people who have a lot of other cars and yeah, would totally. normally spend a lot yeah, more money. Yeah, yeah. And oh, if exactly. the Yaris was auto only, they would not buy it. I think that's absolutely true. But, yeah, I think that's absolutely true. I think there's something about, there's something old, not old fashioned, but old school about it and it may be the you know a lot of the people who are uh, sort of my age uh, who who in their 20s or their their teens mm. the cars to to think about were evos and impressors and things like that this feels like it's spiritual successor to some of those you know but now you're 40 and you can afford one yeah. and because they're actually quite good value actually quite good value and yeah and and, and who's going to make a car like that again who's going to make a manual <laughs> No electrical assistance, four wheel drive, taken off the line, and I don't, I don't know how they can justify making any. Yeah. I, don't know, I don't know who's doing the accounting. Who could say, yeah, that'll make that'll make us loads of money. Don't worry, yeah, we can we can do that. But Toyota, to their great credit, are prepared to do that. They're prepared to. All right, they had to tie in with BMW to get the Supra over the line and with Subaru to get the GT86 done. But they clearly are a company who want to make interesting, good cars to drive and. Yeah. Uh, all power to them, I think. And they love motorsport. And yeah. for most, I think, you, you know, the amount they spend on their Le Mans program and all that sort of stuff, you could you could look at it and go, I don't know how this translates into their road cars at all. But yeah. I think it seeps in. It seeps in slowly. Mm. And doing things like the GT86, doing things like this, make me look at Toyota and go, that is a really cool company. Yeah, I think so. And I think if you, so here's, here's a question. If you could only ever own cars from one manufacturer, but you basically had access, you open a warehouse door and there's an example of every single car yeah. of, a man, of any manufacturer in the world, but only one. So you could only ever drive those again. And I think it's a pretty, for me, it's a pretty short, short list, which involves Porsche, Toyota, Ford, 
Mercedes Benz, and I'm not sure I'd look far beyond far beyond that. It's because you, you, I mean, you could say, yeah, because you could say Ferrari, but then you're basically only you're only ever driving a sports car, which is maybe fine, but you know, not if you want to. Yeah, to a track, you know. So, yeah, P- uh, Porsche is a hard one to look past, isn't it? I think, but it's there's not many on it, and the fact that Toyota, a mainstream for me, would be would be well on it, would be totally up there. Yeah, you know, um, yeah, and for a, for a, for a, for a mainstream manufacturer to do that, and I like, I, I think that's what I like about Toyota. That's what I like about Ford is they do have a commitment to motorsport, and they seem to be run by people who like cars, which is it's cool, you know, which is cool. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Well, I normally wrap these up with five questions. Okay. I think we'll lead on quite nicely to this one. First one, do you have a most memorable driving trip or journey? Uh, yes, probably. Um, oh, I might have two actually, if I can, if I may. But uh, so I drove, I, uh, so I rode uh, a motorbike to uh, Germany and back last summer when we just had, ch- just had chance when it was a couple of months mm. where you could travel quarantine free. And I, I've got an old uh, Honda Africa twin motorbike, which I loved to bits. And I rode to Berlin and back basically did Berlin in a day, did a job next day drove back yeah and that was mega but before that i drove a peugeot 106 gti to the isle of sky in one hit just after my parents retired and we're going they said we're going to travel all the way around the british isles in a motorhome so i said well i'll come and meet you on the west coast of scotland and i got up in the morning drove to sky just just a fantastic drive and it's the first time i've driven in scotland and when you oh, get yeah. to those bits along near fort william and stuff like that it was so quiet. It was so mega. The weather was, because it was sunny and everything, sort of Easterish time. It was just beautiful weather. It was, yeah, it was just, that's, that's to me still, I think probably the best drive, the best drive I've ever had. Yeah. Sounds like a good one. It's that, that part of mega. Scotland yeah. in oh, the right so weather isn't it? is, mm. is so nice. Yeah. Before all the midges are out in summer. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was just, it was, yeah, it was a bit, you know, it was, yeah, it was just fabulous. Yeah. Just really fab. Five car garage unlimited value has to fit into your life has to fit into my life uh yeah i've got um well i mean i've i've always got one but it changes a lot so i know somebody who said yeah i've got a 10 car garage dream garage and i keep it on my phone including the color (laughs) which is great but that's a full-time job how do you do anything how do you do anything else how do you ever get anything else done apart from go oh maybe i don't fancy a 250 (laughs) short wheelbase today uh so uh yeah ferrari 250 gt short wheelbase Porsche 909 Berg Spider, the little hill climb car, which I absolutely love the idea of to bits. Mm. But but you, I think there's something re, there's something really toxic about the brake pads or brakes, something like that. So okay. apparently they have to change those. Uh, but it's yeah, it's a hill climb car that weighs like less than uh, it's a ridiculous amount. It looks it's light. less than 600 kilos. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 an uh, it's got a massive engine yet weighs less than 500 kilos or something like that. I, wow. I forget exactly. But anyway, that that might change for a 917 or a Lola T70. But anyway, Ooh, that's, okay. that's yeah. It. I would have a Holden Special Vehicles W427, which is not very well known. And it's not necessarily the world's greatest saloon car, but I love them to bits. And I, because it's a bit of a time and place car that I did do a first drive of one in Australia and spent the day at a place called Winton Motor, which is a, which is a racetrack in Australia and then on the road. And I just had a great time and it's got a Mm. 7 litre V8. Oh, so, you know, great. it's, it's, yeah, it's awesome. And it's got five seats. So, you know, you could fit a tow bar and stuff if you really had to. Is that three? That's three. That's three. Oh, no, it's, you have it's, a, it does a, get, it's so, it gets so, it gets so, so difficult. Maybe a Toyota FJ series Land Cruiser, um, like an FJ40, something like that, uh, yeah. which I quite like. That would sometimes turn into, that would sometimes turn into a Land Rover Defender 90 or something else. And or or an aerial nomad, it might turn into. Uh, and I would have a probably a Tut Hill prepared Rally Nine Eleven. Oh, I think yeah, because I just I just or or they're too or they. I did a I did a I did a poll recently on Twitter. I put my ten my my ten fancy car yeah. my top ten fancy cars on there, and I said to other people, "What's yours?" Mm. And I just put it up casually on a Friday night, just before I close my laptop for the for the week for the for the evening before I open it up again because. You know, what else is going on? see the results, yeah. And yeah, like nine, I have 900 responses <laughs> with people seeing. So I've put, so I've started putting it in this massive spreadsheet and I've got no room for a McLaren F1 in my five. Sorry, I've just remembered that. Where the hell's that uh, going to go? Well, you could get rid of your, well, I'm not that telling you what you get the, rid of. I don't, uh, mm. Oh, crikey. Maybe the Land Cruiser. 
Yeah, probably Land Cruiser. Land anyway, Cruiser uh, or McLaren F1. Or McLaren F1. <laughs> well, I, you know, I get it because I really like driving off road. You can get so much fun out of it. Could it, you know, would I have more fun more often in a Land yes. Cruiser or would I, or would I in a McLaren? It's, so it's not, yeah, it's not totally straightforward. But anyway, yeah. so I had 900 responses and I thought, well, I've got to start putting these in a spreadsheet. And I've had a couple of industry people go, I'd really like to see, to see that. So the single most popular model, single model, was McLaren F1 followed by Ferrari F40, for, followed by maybe NSX or something like that. I think original NSX. No like paddles in there, anyone no listening? Paddles, no, exactly. No, exactly. But what? But but when you sort of add it up overall, a, nine, a 911 of mm. some kind had many more responses than anything else because it's one of those that people go, well, I, I'll put a 911 in, but actually I'll put in 2.7 RS or recent GT3 yeah. RS or, or whatever. But the interesting thing, maybe it's just on the theme of the stuff we were talking about, Maybe maybe it's just the people who, maybe it's just the people I know. But they were they were not like you say paddle shift cars. They were not all mega mega power cars. You know there weren't that many Aventador SVJs yeah. or seven six five LTs or you know stuff. All you know that weren't actually that many uh, weren't actually that many Chirons and and Veyrons in the great scheme of things. You know there were more aerial nomads and atoms and yeah. caterums than there were mega hypercars. And that's I, I think that's quite a yeah, I think that's quite an interesting. That uh, says a lot about the people that follow you. Well, maybe, or yes, maybe it does. Yeah, maybe it does. I think you're right. Yeah, I think it probably tells me it probably says more about car people on Twitter than it does about car people in in the world, possibly. Generally. Which yeah, is maybe. The, it's because, difficult you know, to put these things together sometimes, isn't it? Because you go, okay, well, they've asked all my friends, and I've asked everyone that I can come across on the internet, <laughs> everyone I know, and yeah, they all but, say. They were in their yeah. top five like all, cars of all time. They would have a 911, which yeah. comes up in this this question. Pretty much most people would have some type mm, of 911. Some 911. But yeah. if I went, it's to, hard to leave out, isn't it? You know, it's hard to leave. It's the greatest sports car ever made. How do you leave? How do you leave it out? But also, how do you pick one? Yeah. Which one do you? You know, which one do you pick? Because so many of them, you could you could oh, make a top five of five. <laughs> you could make a top five of 911s. You know, yeah. I'd just and it would be know, a great easily. top five. <laughs> <laughs> great top five. Great five car garage. Yeah. <laughs> but if you went to the, if I went to the corner of the street. And stopped a hundred people and said, "Okay, do you know what cars are? Right, okay, yeah, five yeah. car garage. It would be very different." Yeah, and a lot of people would go, "Well, why would I want five cars?" Yeah, you know, that would be, be a complete. It would be a complete mystery to them why you might want five cars. And whereas you and I would sit there and go, "Oh, only five? That's hard." <laughs> you know, it's really, yeah, it's um, yeah, it's 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 tough. I. F1 might go for F40. Uh, it's difficult. I've it's, not driven an F1. It's difficult. Unfortunately. I, I've, I've been in not, one, well, not driven one. Yeah, I've driven a, I've driven a, because I once said, uh, I've, I've driven an F40 twice, one, uh, once on the road and once we borrowed one from a guy and he said, good news, it's just come back from being fettled and looked over and only one, but as it turned up and came off the trailer, only one bank of cylinders was working. So <laughs> it was basically about the speed of a yeah. two litre Ford Mondeo. Um, I mean, there, do you, uh, no, do you I've, use, I've, use yours on track, on track much? Uh, no. Your F40? No. How great is it? On road? On the road. Yeah. Cause I've only driven one for about, I've, I've only driven one on four cylinders and one on the road for about three miles. Pretty good. But I do know people who say, well, like Andrew Frankel, who you, who you spoke to a few weeks ago, you know, top one, top one it's, of one. It's, it's just the best. It's pretty good. <laughs> um, <laughs> the I'm problem of the day, the problem with it is the price. Is it worth? Yeah. So, uh, funny enough, Colin Colin Goodwin's got a theory: the less something is worth, the more you are inclined to enjoy it. Exactly. If if that car was a tenth of the price, mm. I would drive it a lot more than 10 times the amount. Yeah. Um, just, and also like if a car costs, let's say I bought an old MX-5 and I was in the middle of the nowhere, I would probably drive it quite hard. Yeah. With like, yeah. it's pretty much zero consequences as long as I'm not mm. near other humans in any way, shape or yes. form, or I go on a track or whatever. Whereas when it's really expensive, yes, you can get comfortable with it and it's, I haven't had a chance to take it on track. I want to take it somewhere where I can try it on track just to feel how it is like fully on the limit before. Yeah, that would be cool, wouldn't it? Yeah. Before I would then take that sort of back to the road. I don't drive that mm. fast on the road anyway because it's all of the reasons. But to have a full understanding of what it's like 
all around the limit would be a lot better. But it, mm. as a driving experience, it's the right level of sketchy. <laughs> like it's it's the suspension is sketchy. Like you, mm. the car moves around an amount that's like questionable sometimes. But it does it at. I've not driven a car that's more fun at sixty miles an hour. Ah, oh, that is cool. That is interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. Like the the yeah. age of it and the suspension, the way everything works and everything moves around, you really feel like you are doing some stuff at, mm. even at sixty. And the way it's constructed means it doesn't feel floppy and everything else. Presumably, does it? It does. It's no. not aged like a like a steel shelled car might, where it starts to sag and stuff only like th- that. It's no, just, only yeah. things like brakes. Yeah. Just feel like the amount of shove versus the amount of stop is pretty crazy. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's great. It's, it's, a, it's a phenomenal thing, but it's just, it's just very expensive, which is a yeah. problem. Yeah. And I think, I think probably the same is about an F1, isn't it? Is that, you know, even, even, even very, very, you know, minted people who've had an F1 sometimes go, I'm just going to sell it because it's worth 20 million quid, whatever yeah. it is. You know, how do you, you how do you use that? with abandon you know it's just uh i mean the good thing is you can never write it off because the rebuild cost <laughs> will never never get anywhere near we borrowed um we did a bit of a special feature with uh with the three sort of ultimate series the mclaren f1 is not an ultimate series mclaren because it's of old mclaren yeah um form but we did we did have one against a, a p1 um and a senna and uh on track and, and it did look like we weren't going to be able to drive the f1 at all because our insurers went no you can't yeah. you can't have it so mclaren phoned their insurers and said we'd like autocar to drive it and their insurers went no we're also haymarket's insurers and no we're not letting you with it so mclaren couldn't basically insure their own car for us to drive it on okay. on track and eventually uh andrew frankel was with us and we made a couple of phone calls and it to haggerty and it, it turned out yes fine and we so at 11 o'clock in the morning it was looking like we would not be able to drive this car anything more than like walking pace for some photos. And by four o'clock in the afternoon, we were at Brunting Thought and we'd driven it until the rear number plate had melted <laughs> because it was just, and it's just, it's it's great to be able to find somewhere. And Brunting Thought's got wide enough corners and things yep. like that where you can you can start to feel, you know, what it will do near its limit. But I think, I mean, if you don't have somewhere like that and even in, in a car with that value, how often do you get near it? It's really hard, isn't it? Yeah. Cars are too, ex- yeah. Cars, they're too they're too desirable in a way, aren't they? Too they desirable are. to use. It's a, it's a good, bad, annoying. I someone said to me, I can't remember who I was talking to, and we were talking about what would you do if your car was worth like, let's say the F forty was worth nothing mm. tomorrow. Yeah. The R dropped out of the market. I mean, I'd be annoyed that I've lost. <laughs> oh, the, yeah, sure. I've yeah, lost sure. the value. Yeah. But if that was like, okay, that car's going to be worth fifty grand for the rest of its life. You know what? I'd mm. probably be. I would worry about it a lot less. I yeah. would just use it a lot more and I would get a lot more enjoyment and have a lot more memories with it. Mm. I'm not saying that's what I want to happen, but th- that car would but get yeah, used a lot yeah, more. I'll tell you point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It would be nice, wouldn't it, if, if cars were not quite so expensive. Valuable. If they were mm. if they cost the same as like cheap stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anything else, basically. Anything else. Yes, Apart exactly. From boats yeah, exactly. and planes. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, yeah. if you go you Sorry, I was going to say. I was going to say. My, I, I I understand that, respectively, well, comparatively, like buying an old World War Two fighter plane is comparatively cheap. You know, you can buy a Spitfire for a million quid or whatever it is, which is a lot of money, but not as you know, not That's not true. McLaren F one times of money because they're so hard to use and they're so you know they take and they're, you know, they're so difficult to use and they're so expensive and they take so much looking after that actually to buy one is not all is not all that much. And you think, well, I mean that's. That would be cool. Right. You know what? You when know, if you go, cool, okay, you can have a Koenigsegg Jesco for whatever it is, two million euros or something, or mm-hmm. for four million euros you can have a Spitfire, or three million euros you can have a Spitfire. You go, well, a Spitfire is quite a lot cooler. Well, than a yeah, totally. Koenigsegg. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, and also, what can you, you know, the the thrills you get from a the thrills you get from a Koenigsegg Jesco, apart from in a straight line, you know, you could. As you say, but if you had an MX-5, you might enjoy it more than you'd be able to enjoy yeah. music. So, yeah, I, I would take an MX-5 and an old World War II fighter plane <laughs> over a Koenigsegg. There you go. That's fantasy, fantasy car. You're a, and if you're like, 
you know, swag factor. You pull up in a Spitfire, you're, you're yeah, apex. I'm just the coolest person. In the, yeah, exactly. You, you pull up in a Koenigsegg and people look at you and go, oh, God, Bennett, really? Who are you? What? <laughs> and as you, whereas if you climb out of a Hawker Typhoon or something, people go, bloody hell. You know, you're <laughs> Black <instantly>, face. <laughs> yeah, you're instantly the coolest person in the room, aren't you, surely? Right. You can only drive, you've got one car to drive for the rest mm-hmm. of your life and you're allowed 500 pounds banger on the side. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, a Ferrari 250 GT short wheelbase. Fair. That's always, and I I've never driven one and uh, I'm told they're, I'm told they're very nice, you but should, I don't know. Um, you should and, get over uh, to GTO engineering, get them on yeah, the exactly, blower. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah, a I, bloody great it thing. Is, I just, yeah, I just, and I, do, but, uh, but, but anytime somebody says, God, what car would you take down this road? Or what car would you drive down this track with? I, I've struggled to quite often to look very much further, even though I've, even though I've never tried one. And maybe it's, I don't know. It's, it's not disappointment, presumably. It's very good. It's very good. good. Uh, the ergonomics were quite painful for me. Yeah, that's difficult. Um, like pedals and stuff. I'm not that, I'm six foot. Oh, okay. Um, so not, and not, I don't have particularly long legs. Mm. Um, so it's a bit... It's, if, I could sort the, if I could sort that, if you could sort the seating position, I think you then, can sort the seating yeah, out. then something, something like that. It's, I don't, and I don't know why, but it's, 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 it's the right size, it's the right power, it's you know, the right engine, it's the right gear. It's like the car, it's, isn't it? It's got the ingredients. When you, yeah, I in terms so. of yeah. older stuff, it's yeah. just, they're just an amazing looking thing, amazing sounding and yeah, yeah, great to drive. Great to drive. Yeah, and if it's and if it's there and it exists, I would I'd use it all the time. And the five hundred pound banger, I might only use for the tip, and then I just use it for the rest of the time all yeah. the time. I just I'd, yeah, I just adore the shape, and it just yeah works for me on every level. Okay, best value car under fifty k uh, is a does it new or used? Is this? Uh, I would say it's a circa two thousand and nine Ford Fiesta ZTEC S. <laughs> which I think is the greatest ride and handling compromise uh, and steering compromise and also a value and speed and everything else. I wanted a sixth gear in one, but other than that, I think they're absolutely perfect. I think naturally aspirated 1.6 of around 130 horsepower, maybe something like that. And I just thought, yeah, I remember when we did loads of group tests and stuff at the time and somebody on the magazine ran one for like six months or something. Every time I got in it, I was just... This is perfect. Yeah. You don't want, this is absolutely perfect. It's so well engineered. It's so well put together. Everything is, yeah, everything's right. Give me one of those with CarPlay. I'm nice. Happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What's the most interesting car to you at the moment? What are you looking at? Uh, that's, oh, that's interesting. It was a BMW i8 a little while ago um, because it was just so, in, it was so interesting. There was so much going on. What is the most interesting car? It's, and of course, then you know the fact that it was largely electric powered was novel, and now it, that is no longer no novel. So, so what's interesting? The most interesting car to me at the minute, new McLaren, <sighs> that remotely bit, feature bit, on your radar. It does. I mean, it does. Yeah, it does, but not as much as some of the more some of the more mainstream some of the more mainstream stuff. In it, I think really, um, maybe the Yaris is the most interesting. Just in that, I'm still. I'm running one for a little while and I'm still finding out things. There's still lots I want to know about it. Yeah. Even though I've done, you know, quite a lot of miles in, in, in one already, there's still things I'm interested to, to find out. Okay. But, um, okay. Yeah. Okay. That or the GTO engineering 250. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is something um, that I'm realizing and I'm, I'm learning fast is uh, every now and then someone will let me, lend me a car for a bit or whatever. Mm-hmm. And during the lockdown period of, had people be, I've been able to have them for like a week. They drop it off at my house. And often the guy that drops it off is like anything you want to know or whatever, but like, here's the car, here's the keys, like see ya. And then I'll only realize like four days later when I'm trying to make a video or something that there's a whole bunch of stuff I don't know how to do in this car. Or it's the way, for example, when I had an A110, I just... There was just things I just didn't know. Like I didn't know there was a track mode if you hold down sport for ages. Oh yeah. So there's yeah. stuff like that, that you just like, I want to know how all the driving modes work. I want to know how to turn traction control off, all these sorts of things. Like step one. And I'm now like, I am going to ask. So I'm going to ask you with the Yaris, what mm-hmm. do I need to know before I drive that car in terms of driving the car? 
the nice thing is you don't need to know you don't need to know a lot. So the right. first thing the first thing I do when I get in is uh, it tells me I'm cold, it's cold and I shouldn't accelerate briskly. But <laughs> right, fine, I know. So I click the thing the back button so that that goes off. And then on this side of the steering wheel, uh, there's the lane assist which defaults to on. Okay. But it's one extended push to turn that off because otherwise that gets very annoying very That's quickly. Useful, yeah. The centre console has now it depends which I've got a track um, pack. It's track back. Okay, great. So in the center console, there is a there is a there is a knob which, if you turn one way, puts it into sport mode, and uh, that changes the power distribution, which in standard mode is slightly to the front. That changes it slightly to the back, and then if you turn it the other, if you press it, that puts it in track mode, which basically puts it 50, 50, 50. You can't set the diffs, the diff locking thing yourself. It works out that for its own. Yeah, that's what I still want to investigate more of. So. I want to get it on a skid pan or a low friction surface and really just mess around with those mm. modes and see how much difference they make to the attitude of it. But the nice thing about it is, and that is what's nice about it, as opposed to getting in an E63 AMG or something where, or an AMG GT, where you've got six buttons down here, which change damper levels and gearbox response and engine response and steering. So there's none of that, which is great because you just go, right, well, I'm just in and I've just turned off the driver assist yeah. that I don't want. And I'm just, I'm just having fun with it so yeah that's the that's that's the nice thing i'll tell you what i um I'll tell you what i would like to know uh, when you have it is if you is how far you can run it down before refueling it because i read <laughs> somewhere it's got a 50 liter fuel tank but i've got nowhere near putting 50 liters in it and it's telling me i'm going to nearly run out and i'm not but i've not yet had the bravery to go i'm going to keep going <laughs> i will not be doing that so oh, okay so all right you can't maybe i one. will maybe i'll but get it's, um, put a fuel yeah, can in the back yeah, exactly. Well, that's what I'm going to, that's basically what I'm now going to, yeah, I'm going to A, double check that it has got a 50 litre fuel tank because it's, <laughs> it seems like it, it surely it can't, and I'm just reading it wrong. But there's, the cool thing about it is it's, is it's, uh, you know, there's, a, there's, there's, there's lots to get into and it doesn't, you, you, you don't under, you know, you can use the car quite easily and know enough about it to enjoy it quite a lot, but I think there are depths to it. And I think that's probably part, probably part of its appeal is that, you know, he, it will take you a while, yeah. partly because it's so capable on the road. You know, you just, it's so fast on the road for, for a modestly powered car. And I think it probably does take a little while to really get to, you know, to get to get understand to it. Grips with it, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's funny yeah. that but it's 300 cool. horsepower. Oh, no, it's like 270. Is that yeah, right? 250, 250. Well, it's supposed to have 257, but I think Litchfield put one on a rolling road in a standard. It was 270 something. So it's a, so it's a lot. And, you know, tyres are so much better than they were in the old evo and impressors mm. day and it probably weighs a bit you know it doesn't weigh any more than those i think it's tw uh, 1280 kilos or 1300 kilos something so it's not well, it weighs not very much and it's it's so supple in its suspension and everything as well that it's just it it's one of those cars that you know if somebody said right today all the roads are one way and there's nobody on them you you know and you've got to drive using no motorways from there to yeah. there um, you wouldn't go any quicker in anything it's bonkers totally bonkers but great, but great. It's fun, loads of traction, loads of grip, you know, but but good fun with it. That's the nice thing. You don't have to be driving at a million miles an hour, although it quite likes to be driven at a million miles an hour. <laughs> you don't have to be driving at a million miles an hour to get the best out of it. Well, I'm very looking forward to driving it. Oh, I, I'm looking forward to, to seeing what you think, because, yeah, I think it's I think it's cool. Yeah, I think it's really cool. cool. Well, thanks very much for coming on the podcast. No, thanks for having me. It's absolutely been my pleasure. Thank it's you. It's been great to, great to meet.